Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Copernicus Marine Service Workshop um, dedicated to the African community. Um, today, uh, we will have a practical session. Um, yesterday, we had our first session um, full of presentations. We introduced you to the Copernicus Marine Service. We had um, a lot of presentations from our um, data producers. We introduced you to the Marine um, Copernicus Marine Service uh, product and data. And we also introduced you to some uh, very interesting use cases. Um, today, we will have a practical session. My name is Andrea Carvalho. I'm a training officer at Mercator Ocean International, and I will be your host for today. Um, just before we start, I would like you um, to know a few things you will need for this workshop. Um, first, we will have a platform uh, throughout this whole workshop and um, even beyond uh, dedicated to the e-learning materials. Um, it's called the Padlet, and here on your screen, you can see um, the link. Um, to access the Padlet. Uh, there you will have access to um, um, the replays of yesterday's and today's session. So if you were not here with us um, yesterday, you will be able to um, see that uh, our presentation. Um, you will also have access to the tutorials we will show you today in today's session um, and many other um, information. So you can see the link here on the screen, but I will also post it on the on the comments. So we are using Zoom to um, to broadcast this session, but um, for the questions, which we hope you will have many, um, we are using Slido and um, we will also post the link on the comments. But um, if you go to slido.com and you type this code that you can see on your screen, uh, you will have access to our session. And there, there's, uh, there is where you should put your questions to our speakers and to us. Um, one very important information about today's session is that you will be able to have live interpretation. So we are, we will be presenting in English, but if you would like to, um, to have French interpretation of today's session, you, uh, if you look at your uh, Zoom uh, window, you will find a button with this um, symbol here, saying interpretation. Uh, you should click on it and you, you will listen to our interpreters. And after some guidelines, I will uh, introduce you to our speakers and uh, tell you a bit about our, our, our agenda for today. So today we will have Cédric Jordan. Uh, he's a user support manager from Mercator Ocean International um, and he's gonna be telling you about the user corner, uh, how you can contact the user support and how you can access some e-learning materials as well. Uh, we will have Anne Esperant. Uh, she's a Copernicus Marine Service Officer, and she will uh, give us a live demonstration of uh, My Ocean Viewer. Um, and we will have um, Alvaro and Stefania. Uh, they are both ocean modelers at uh, NoLogin, and they will um, uh, give us very interesting tutorials um, about the Jupyter, with Jupyter, using Jupyter Notebooks and the QGIS. Um, so I hope you enjoyed today's session. Um, don't forget to put all your questions um, on Slido. So I will introduce our first speaker, Cédric Jourdain. Um, whenever you want, the floor is yours. I am uh, Cédric Jourdain, so I'm user support manager. I will give you an overview of the of the user corner, which is an area dedicated to users to uh, to handle the service and uh, to our information about products, etc. So you should see the 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 main page of the the website so to reach the user corner it is in the the top menu user corner clicking on the on it i reached uh, several uh, boxes and the first one is getting started so as it is uh, as you can see with the, the name you can have clues and information to begin with the copernicus Marine service you have different uh, different links to the, the offer, ocean products, state report, indicators, visualization, and operational paths to uh, to have links with links to to uh, to manage the, the, the service. So search, visualize, download, etc. So it is uh, the first page to visit if you want to uh, to use the, the Copernicus Marine service. If I come back to the user corner section, the second box is a real, real important uh, box 
because it will uh, give you access to the help center. In this help center, you will find more or less 140 articles <clears throat> about on, on several topics, on the products, on the services, the download, the, the, the visualization, etc. So for example, you can click on the search area, you can give a, a keyword, and you have the different uh, different article ma matching this uh, keyword. So, for example, the first one, how to load Copernicus Marine products. I click on the on the um, on the title, and I read the the article with the menu, the time to read. The menu is as well on the on the right right side of the the screen, and then you should you, you will uh, find uh, screenshots or videos, and uh, step by step it information to uh, to uh, to master the the service so this is for the download if i have for example if you have information about the motion viewer the motion pro the, the which anais will present you uh, just after this uh, presentation so you type motion in the search area and you reach the introduction to motion pro viewer etc and the main feature etc so this feature the app center is really 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 important to have uh, important information on the services and the products i come back to the the user corner the the, the third box is the user notification service so i click on it i reach a dedicated page to inform you users about the operational events related to product and services. So there are four different categories, so general, improvements, incidents, and maintenance. So if I click on incidents, for example, here you, you will find the list of all the incidents related to a specific product. So you have the status on the right, you have the first date of the, the date of uh, first publication. And if I click on the title, I have the details on the incident the status and the product impacted. And what is useful and important in this page is you can create an RSS feed. For example, you can create your own RSS feed using the different filters on all the free text area. For example, here I will find only the incident related to the product, uh, the global product uh, 124. You can make this view an RSS feed and you can subscribe this RSS feed to be automatically informed on uh, in case of new delay or new incident on this product. And uh, if I go back to the help center, for example, if I type the, 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 the keyword inform, how to be informed of operational events on the product and services, I click on the article and you will find the step-by-step -step to create and to subscribe this RSS feed. So I come back to the, the corner. The following box is the user learning services. So here you will find information about on the training and events uh, manager in the for the Copernicus Marine Service. So here, for example, you have the uh, link to the, the the marine data for Africa. The box after is related to the e-learning e materials. Here you can see many materials, which can sort by uh, level, subject, and tool, or free text area, and then. All these uh, all these materials are fully available for you, and you can. So it's in, it's quite interesting to check this page and to check all the materials available. The next box is the product quality. So this uh, this mini mini site in, in, in the embedded the mini site, mini site is uh, dedicated to the quality of the product. So we will find uh, gen generic information on the quality of the the product. You can sort by area. Arctic, Baltic, etc. On the color of the ocean, so blue, green, white, and these pages are dedicated to the quality of all the products. So do not hesitate to to check it and to ask question to the user support if you uh, if you have any. Then, then there is a uh, an area dedicated to the roadmap, which is for this this page is currently uh, reviewed to propose. Uh, information on the future evolution of the products for midterm. So, for you will uh, you will have the date of the improvement, the impacted products, and a short description of the improvement. So, the work on this page is ongoing, and it, say she, it will propose information for, for uh, for example, for uh, information on the, the the November 2023 release or the March March 2024 release. But for the moment, so it's ongoing. Though you will have uh, we'll have only information on the past improvements. Get inspired. It will, it will here you will find different uh, examples of application of 
you, of the, the different application using the Copernicus Marine Service products. Here you will find the, the, the use cases presented yesterday. You can sort by region, by country, or by market. And clicking on the, on the icon, you will uh, find the description of the use case, the product used, and the different the useful links and the benefits for users. All the use cases are uh, are made on the following this uh, this um, this sample. So you can submit your 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 case here. So do not hesitate. You will reach a, a form to fill in and to and submit this form to the team dedicated in charge of the, the use cases. User corner. Then the, the last uh, boxes, the first one is to log in or register. So you will find the registration page. This one, service commitments and license, you will find our uh, commitments on the, what time do, I, do we need to, to answer a question? To uh, what are your uh, obligation? Because even if the, the service is completely free, uh, for example, you, you have to cite the source of the product if you use them in your, in your application. So all is detailed in this document. And the last uh, box is the contact us form, but to contact us, it's the best is to use the, the chat platform here at the bottom right. In this uh, widget, you will have a, a link to the, to the help center. You can search the same the same behavior. You can search here using, for example, a keyword "inform." Uh, how to be informed? I, I find again the article dedicated to uh, to uh, operational events. And if you are authenticated, so registered and authenticated. So, for example, I am going to uh, to log in, and when I am authenticated, I have the possibility to send the message to the the team. So, don't hesitate to use this uh, this uh, feature and you will reach a member of the team, Anaïs or Martin or anyone else. And so do not hesitate to contact us if you have uh, any question. But the first feature to, uh, to visit and to use, it is the help center section with many, many information inside. So do not hesitate to check this feature. And if you, have, uh, if you still have any question, do not hesitate to contact us using the chat section. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cédric. Um, that was very nice. And um, yeah, now you all know um, what to do if you want to access data and uh, if you have any questions. Um, I ac we actually have a few questions. Um, they are a bit general, um, not necessarily about the user corner, but maybe I can um, share. Oh, great. Um, so I think, yeah, you mentioned it already, like, right? The, like in terms of commercial use of yes. uh, Copernicus data, is there any so, specific rules? No, whatever the use, commercial or or not, uh, the data is free. Are free. The only have to 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 cite the the source of the data. Everything is explained in the DM center. There is a an article dedicated data policy. So everything is free, whatever the use. Yeah, exactly. Great. Um, and okay, this one is a bit more specific, no. but <laughs> maybe you can they can search directly on the on the on the data catalog as well about uh, what sort of wind products we we have available. I guess yes, you can uh, go to the catalog, and though you can specify your search uh, on the on the specific variable or a, a free uh, a keyword, etc. So you will find all the the products in the in the main data store catalog. Yeah. And then the next few questions, uh, two questions are about um, the type of courses we uh, made available for you guys. And uh, um, yeah, it does include a bit of, but well, we have several tutorials like Cédric mentioned um, already on our website and you will see there's a, few, a bit of modeling and data visualization over there. Uh, then we don't do specifically on that, but our tutorials in include that as well. So um, I suggest you just uh, explore that section that Cédric mentioned. And um, yeah, I think we're good for the, for the moment. Thank you, Cédric. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> now I will introduce you uh, Anaïs Perrin, and she will introduce a very cool feature of uh, our uh, Copernix Morning Service, which is the viewer. And uh, she's going to tell us how to access the data and visualize the data. Hope you enjoy it. So hello, everyone. I'm Anaïs from the user support team of Copernicus Marine. I will introduce you the main feature of the MyOcean Viewer Pro, 
So to access it, you just have to click on ocean visualization here. So you have here three different uh, ocean visualization. Uh, the My Ocean Learn, dedicated for beginners. The My Ocean Light uh, for intermediates. And the My Ocean Pro for experts uh, like you. So I will uh, choose uh, My Ocean Pro visualization tool. Uh, you have two uh, different layers open on your interface. So if you pass your mouse uh, on the name of the variable, you have access to the name of the open product as well as the data set and the variable here and here. So these two layers come from two uh, global forecast projects. The first for uh, the physical data, here the temperature, and the second for biological data, here for the chlorophyll A. In this presentation, uh, we will focus on the Egoless current, uh, this strong current uh, south uh, of South Africa. And uh, we will see how the temperature of the waters follows the intensity and the direction of the current. So to search for products through our catalog, you just have to click on Had layer here, and you arrived uh, on the Copernicus Marine Data Store, uh, where near 300 products are present. So uh, we therefore have all of our products classified different categories, the most popular, and you can also click uh, in the arrow to see the rest of the product in this category. You also have the recently view for the projects recently opened on your MyOcean, uh, the indicators and trends and so on. The short description of the products inform us about the name of the product here. The data simulation mode, whether it's a model or an observation, uh, like here with satellite. Uh, you uh, have also the temporal coverage here and the variables present in it. The filters column uh, on your left allows you to refine your search by entering uh, keywords or informing the time coverage uh, or clicking directly on the parameters corresponding to your search. So, um, I can write here uh, current, for example, or even mark uh, velocity as a variable. Uh, I will add uh, the global ocean for the area, and I will choose the hourly for temporal resolution. Uh, and I want to stay on the numerical model here. So you have here uh, four projects correspond to your search. Uh, if you look, look a little closer at uh, the name of this project, you uh, can see that the first is a forecast project uh, containing a physical uh, variable such as um, mixed layer thickness, salinity, sea ice, including uh, current speed, the velocity here. Uh, it's therefore a project containing the re most recent data because it's an uh, analysis and forecast. Then we have a uh, multi-year uh, projects relating to older data and having wave, uh, wave data, so it's not interesting for us here. The two last uh, projects uh, are multi-observation uh, project containing uh, model data and satellite observation. Uh, and in your case, uh, we will stay on the most recent data and thus select the first, the global analysis and forecast project here. So we arrived on the description page of this project where you can find a short description of this project and the references when is when available. And a section called classification here uh, describes the parameters taken into account uh, on, in this project, like uh, the spatial uh, extent and resolution, the variable, and much more. On the left, you uh, will see other tabs like notification that tracks all the incidents, improvements, and maintenance in progress or passed in the project. Uh, the data access tab, which allows you to access um, different data sets contained in the project, as well as direct links uh, to the Mochi interface, opened up. Uh, FTP WMS by clicking on the small um, 
bubble here information icon, uh, you can um, uh, arrive directly on the articles of uh, our Earth Center by looking with the chosen access mode. This article uh, are there to explain you how to use the download mode, how to the download mode works. The contact tab here allows you to contact the Help Center. And then you have a documentation section uh, with links uh, to the user manual document, the quality information document, the license, and a link to our article how to cite uh, Siemens products uh, in your work. The user manual uh, document contains all the information um, relating to the product and the quality information documents provides information relating to the mode of data acquisition. If you like the product, you can share it uh, using the share, share icon here at the top right. And this button allows you to uh, copy the URL uh, address of the product. So to visualize the variables of the product, you just have to click on the Add to Map and you can then uh, choose the variables of interest in the different data sets of the product. You will notice here that each data set concerns a type of variable with a different um, temporal resolution of the data. The first, uh, the three first, uh, um, are data relating to the current here. Um, uh, every six hour for 6H, uh, daily for, with the D, and monthly. Then you have uh, the salinity here and the temperature here. Uh, all this data set contains variables in three dimension and the rest, um, and the rest, so uh, the analysis and uh, forecast here uh, and the merge UV, uh, it's a uh, two dimensional uh, uh, data gathering measure uh, many variables. So I will choose um, the three dimension data set in order to explore the most features of the MyOcean viewer. So let's take the first data set and choose uh, the seawater velocity variable here. And I click to app to map. Okay. So you have here um, our three variable open on your interface. Um, you can easily pan around the map by holding the down the left click and zooming in and out using your mouse wheel. For more visibility, uh, we can change the priority order of the layer by dragging them up or down here. Um, I can also choose to hide uh, a layer or not by using the eye here. So we can you can also delete uh, a layer by clicking on the cross. And here we will remove the data layer uh, from profile A here. So um, you see that uh, four to five icons uh, are present. The so first is um, the download icon here. Uh, so second return uh, the project description page. The layer icon here uh, allows you to change the open variable by another present in the product. The gear is used to customize uh, the layers. And finally, the log icon is used to apply a logarithmic scale of the, to the data. This option uh, is not present is in all the variable. Uh, for the sake of the visibility, I will modify the opacity of the current layer. And I will change the color palette here. Uh, I can also modify the minimum and maximum values uh, to apply and uh, decide or not to mask uh, the values ex exceeding uh, the limit. Uh, here, uh, we, uh, we have uh, another option uh, available, the style. Um, it's a unique feature uh, of a velocity layer. Uh, I can uh, make uh, this uh, layer as a solid, uh, like here, uh, solid plus vector uh, or only a vector. And I will choose to simple uh, visualize the vectors. 
So regarding the temperature layer here, um, we notice that the information icon that it's the same product as uh, that we previously opened. Uh, with this layer icon here, um, I can uh, view another data set like the temperature variable, but uh, for the resolution of six hour here. Uh, I will also change the color of the, the temper temperature layer by clearly see the difference here. Okay, it's better. Uh, so uh, thanks to the bottom bar here, you can change the date um, for, uh, of your visualization. Uh, available data is symbolized by the thicker white uh, line here. And if I choose to visualize the several dates uh, randomly uh, like uh, this, uh, we notice that the egoless current uh, is one of the most uh, regular uh, that we know. Uh, by zooming a little more, uh, by scrolling uh, with your mice wheel, uh, you can uh, even view uh, the data uh, hour by hour here. Uh, this is only possible because the data is hourly data. And uh, if you uh, use the left and right arrow uh, uh, on your keyboard, you can also change uh, the uh, date of the data visualization, but six hour by six hour. Another option is available with the three dimension layer. You can uh, select the depth level uh, thanks to the bar at the right. By default, the data displays the surf at surface data here, but you can change this parameter by clicking on the scale um, and use your up and down arrow on your keyboard. You can also uh, zoom in and out uh, using your mouse wheel uh, on the bar. Uh, and uh, we can see that the egress current is the surface current uh, which dissipates uh, with the depths. Above this scale, uh, you have different objects uh, that can be created, a point here, uh, lines for transect, uh, and area here. Um, this, um, uh, you have also uh, the settings of the MyOcean uh, viewer, uh, where you can, for example, change the units of your object. Uh, like here, here, the units of kilometer or miles uh, and uh, the units of your area. Uh, the creation object is useful for visualizing, visualizing graphs based on your open variables, uh, but also for downloading this particular area. And for more visibility, I will delete uh, some uh, object here. Um, so you can see here uh, graphics appear with the creation of object. This is the representation of the sample of data for this location. You can delete graph here and make other appear depending on the variable uh, open on your HFS here for temperature or see whether velocity you can add graph. You can also choose to uh, download uh, this data in CSV format here, uh, but uh, to do so, you must enter your credential, Siemens credential. Here, it's or it's work because I filled it before. Uh, if I log out uh, using the settings uh, here, uh, you will see uh, that uh, clicking on the icon for downloading the sample in CSV format is reserved for users with an icon and other user uh, that's registered. As a reminder, the registration is completely free. Your credential will be requested if you don't have filled it before. Uh, each time you want to that download the data, uh, thanks in if I click on the download icon here, um, uh, I, I must connect. So uh, not the downloading, not that the downloading of the data is only carry out a sample of data. It doesn't reflect all the data uh, in your object, even if you increase the resolution like this. So let's move on the download uh, part. Uh, to do this, uh, let's go to uh, the download icon of the variable you want to download. Uh, here, 
uh, we need to fill in uh, the geographical area we need. Uh, we can either manually enter your coordinates uh, or use the define on map option. Uh, with this option, you can, uh, you can draw directly on your map your area here. Uh, you can also, uh, the, the coordinates is un are enter. Um, you can also uh, delete uh, your area using the cross here, and you can uh, even select a previous uh, object uh, like uh, this, for example, for the point. Uh, the date range section here, uh, you must fill the time period you are interested in. Uh, next to it, it indicates uh, the time period available uh, for this variable in the product to be sure to uh, indicate dates including in this one. Uh, same way as the define on map option, you can automatically uh, select uh, the date on your visualization by clicking on as in map here. And if I de-zoom, I can select another date here and as it map. Same things for elevation range. Uh, here I will stay on the surface data here. Um, so for data sets containing several variables, uh, you have an additional section called also download, which allows you to download several variables containing in the data set at the same time. Uh, for example, I will change uh, the temperature layer with uh, uh, data set with many other uh, variable here. And if I want, I go to the download icon, I have the option also download and I can select the other variable I want to download I at the same time uh, at the uh, C surf CI surface. So uh, I will delete it. Okay. Uh, a world of caution, though, uh, downloading uh, via Motu is subject to one gigabyte about uh, data uh, download limit. Uh, if your request exists, exceed uh, this limit, um, uh, like this, for example, for example, here, a red message appears in red, and the links takes you to the data access tab. From where, by clicking on the information icon, you have access to article from our health center, as seen previously. Uh, so um, next to it, you have the show API request button, which allows you to open the requests that correspond to your parameterized data. This request is useful when you want to download uh, your data uh, programmatically, for example. Uh, in case of problem, you can contact the health center. Uh, by clicking on the small bubble at the top, talk to an expert here. Um, so uh, if you have a problem, in particular in the download problem, it's important to communicate to us your API request. Uh, that uh, we can help you uh, as best as we can. To do this, I will open a chat, a chat session and uh, click on the API request. Uh, copy and paste it into my message. So uh, you will also notice uh, that in the home tab of this chat, uh, you have um, uh, directly access to uh, our article here, present in the Health Center. Uh, you can search uh, for an article by entering keywords, uh, such as uh, my ocean, for example. Here. So uh, you uh, so you have by the way an article that tell you how uh, to view the data in the MyOcean Pro, like in this presentation. Uh, you will notice that at the end of this article, you have a question and answer session uh, that uh, we regularly update with the most uh, asked question about the MyOcean viewer. Uh, so the MyOcean Pro uh, has also a sharing functionality by clicking on the 
icon here, share. Uh, you can then share the link of your visualization uh, with whoever you want. Create an image or even a video. You can even generate a, a numbered uh, link to include your visualization on your website, for example. So uh, finally, you have a, a, an information icon here, which details all the keyboards, shortcuts, uh, you can uh, use on the MyOcean. Uh, don't forget that uh, we have some articles available on your Herb Center concerning the MyOcean viewer, but not only. The user support team is nevertheless here to answer your question and to help you if you encounter uh, difficulties. Thank you. Thank you, Anais. Um, that was very cool. I always like uh, your presentations. <laughs> um, uh, just a quick reminder to everyone. Um, uh, I know this can be a bit overwhelming uh, if you're seeing this for the first time, the viewer and all the tutorials we will be showing you to, to, to you today. Uh, but uh, so we uh, recommend you not to try to follow it at the same time. Um, just uh, sit down and relax, uh, <laughs> try to understand a little bit, and then you can later on um, maybe rewatch these presentations and do it at your own pace, especially if you're a beginner. We don't really recommend you to do that. Um, so now, if you can stop sharing your screen, Anise, I will um, yeah. share the thank you, the questions. And we already have a few questions for you. Uh, if you use the MyOcean system to create a figure for publication, would it be sufficient to cite a data set used or should you reference MyOcean as well? I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but yeah. Uh, I think you just have to uh, cite the reference of the product you use um, uh, in, your in your works, uh, like uh, uh, credits. That's uh, a... Yeah. Yeah, no need to uh, for we, extra. Oh, yeah. we, we have an article on your app center, how to cite um, uh, CMEMS products uh, in oh, our app center that can help uh, for this question. Okay, yeah, great. I will put it on the comments then. Um, great. And um, can we get access to this video? Oh, I think you mean the presentation of today. If you do mean that, um, yes, everything will be available on the Padlet. Uh, that I uh, mentioned in the beginning of our workshop. Um, so you will be able to rewatch all of this. Um, can you scale the vectors on the velocity plot? Uh, the vector is automatically automatically um, uh, applied and uh, calculate. Uh, we, I don't think it's possible to change the direction and, uh, and the length of the vector. Uh, mm -hmm. but this can be uh, um, an improvement uh, in the yeah. future. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, is it possible to add other colors or, co yeah, like to no. the color bar, such as chat no. on the color map? <laughs> <laughs> for the no. moment, uh, we have a palette of the color and uh, you can just select the, the, the color present in the, uh, in the My Ocean. There's a quite a, a wide range of of uh, of colors already <laughs> as well. I find it. <laughs> you just have to find which one is the best. <laughs> um, is it possible to download in PDF format instead of CSV format? No, only CSV, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what is the format of the data when we download it, and what software can we use it to visualize the data? So I guess. Yes, CSV. Uh, oh, or the data, they are visualizing it on the viewer, maybe. Uh, you can use an uh, embed, uh, embed link uh, in your uh, HTML uh, website, for example. You can also use uh, the embed link in your um, uh, notebook uh, in Python, for example. Um, it's uh, just for a visualization. You can, uh, if you want to download your um, representation, your visualization, you can um, um, you use the share um, video or image. Uh, 
uh, in a PNG format. Yeah. Okay. And uh, when you download your data, it's a C uh, net CDF format. And um, one last one, maybe. Uh, is there any information about the differences between data sets? How do we know which one we have to choose? Yeah, you can refer to the uh, user manual document uh, or the quality information document. In this uh, document, you are all the uh, technical uh, information about the product. Uh, in the quality information document, you have access to data access mode, uh, data mode, um, data acquisition mode uh, use, uh, and you can, um, uh, thanks to this document, shows the products uh, that uh, must uh, fill in your uh, needs. Great. Great. So, um, plenty of information. You just have to look for it. <laughs> uh, great. Um, thank you very much, Anais. Unfortunately, we don't have time for more questions, but uh, we will try to answer them all, um, ask our speakers to answer them later on and share with you the answers. Thank you very much, Anais. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker um, was going to present us a very interesting um, tutorial um, <clears throat> using a Jupyter notebook. Um, Alvaro. Hi, good and, morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, so yeah, whenever you want, Alberto, the floor is yours. So okay. just to a quick reminder to everyone, um, this can be a bit overwhelming, so try not to do it at the same time. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, don't worry, you will be able to do it at your own pace later on. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, enjoy. It's interesting to think that, uh, well, despite of these tutorials are designed uh, to for people that doesn't need to have previous knowledge, but uh, if you want to have a 100% of understanding of what is in the, in the tutorial, maybe it's quite uh, overwhelming and, and you need uh, deep knowledge, but you, even if you don't have many knowledge about the Python, environment you can run the you can run the, the tutorials you can run the examples and you can learn a lot i think so this is as always is just a start doing things and in this part you will learn a lot uh, let me share my screen it's okay can you... yes perfect okay great so i'm gonna jump here probably Yes, Frederick explained how to, to reach to this web page where you can log into the Jupyter Hub. This log is, is done with your username and your password from Copernicus. And when you log here, you get this, you get this web page. So here you can we can have or you can see. There is two specific areas. This is the area where we are going to work. There is, in the left side, there is an area which is a file browser. You can see here that there is your folder. This is your home folder. For me, it's the home, home folder for, for my user account. And I have few folders inside of the, the folder, but the, any user will have their can have their own folders here and their own documents. Yes, you can make a right click here and create folders, create documents, etc. We will see later how does it work. And also we have here the bigger uh, workspace. This is a workspace where we are going to now spend most of time. And you can see this works in a in a in a viewer, in a web viewer. So well, it's, you can enter here with any viewer and for sure you can collapse the file browser just clicking on here. Um, it's interesting here, we have some elements, uh, the notebooks, the notebooks is the main element we are going, going, going to use here in, the, in this tutorial. And we also have the, the, the terminal, uh, these terminals are terminals of 
of uh, Linux, Linux systems. So if you click on here, you can enter in a terminal of the, your, of the Linux system here in your home, home folder. Uh, I don't know if the people is knows about much about Linux system. Just uh, it's a system where you can work with commands. For example, if you, if you write double L, you you get uh, the, the list of directories, the list of uh, folders you have in your in the directory where you are. So you can also move from one directory to another with with CD. You can write CD to uh, for example, this old, too old. So now you, uh, I am in the in the old uh, directory. So I, I can see different different courses and different files I have stored here. To go back, you just can write cd space dot dot double dot, and you come back to to your home. Other. Well, we, this is a tool we are going to use to, to copy the, the, the training, the tutorial to our home folder, because it's really important for any user to, to, to keep in mind that, uh, first of all, what we have to do to, to start working is to copy the, the tutorial, the, the, to copy the tutorial to your home folder. If you don't have the tutorial copied here in your home folder. You, you won't be able to run the tutorial. You won't be able to, to include changes in the tutorial. And when, well, uh, one question is where is the tutorial? Well, everyone should have this uh, link, share notebooks in the in their homework, homework, home uh, directory. So following this directory, we can, Let's expand this. We can see a lot of uh, trainings that has been uh, uh, created in the past. So any user can go for these tutorials and these trainings, and probably most of them are are shown in the web page of the training. So anyone can take any training and start working and learn as much as they can. In this case, we are going to focus our attention in, in this training, the training of, for Africa to, to 2023. So to copy this, this training to our home directory, the first thing we are going to do is, uh, is this one with right click. We can, we have here the copy path. We can copy the path of the tutorial. We copy the path. And now in the in the command line we can write copy minus r. It's important this minus r, uh, and we can paste the the path we have uh, copied here. You can see it's very simple path, which is shared notebooks at training Africa twenty twenty three. Uh, actually, is this path shared notebooks training Africa 2023? And after this, we have to write where do we want to copy the, the tutorial. And so we can put just a dot. It's important to put this dot. If we don't put, put this little dot, this becomes in an error. <laughs> These are the rules of Linux. If you don't put things in, in this place, in its place, <laughs> you will get lots of errors. So we can put the, the dot. And um, well, uh, this can take about 30 seconds, about, about uh, one minute, not, not much. I think it, don't, it won't be so much. So we come back here, clicking in this folder, we come back to the home directory and you can, you can see up, oh, it has finished. Uh, you can see here, we can continue. It's writing our commands. So this means that the, the system is finishing, uh, copying the, the tutorial. And here we have now the new folder of the training for Africa. So now we, are, we can start working in the training. 
just now, not before, because because now we can include changes in the in this folder because this folder has been copied into our home directory, and we are the rights to modify the folder right here. So we can close this tab right here. Um, let's go over the, the training to see what it has. Well, it has just three new folders, uh, a folder with what well, that we have called data. This, these are the folder with the data downloaded from Kimems. I will talk about this later. Uh, we have another folder figures, which is empty right now, and images that is not very interesting. This folder includes images for notebooks. And here we have what is really important for users, for any user, the first and the second uh, notebook for beginner, for uh, users, and for intermediate users. Now we are going to work with this beginner uh, tutorial, so let's open it by Double click on it. Well, we have it right here. I don't know why this, I'm sorry. Image is not working. Ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, well, this is the beginning of our, our oh, I'm going to collapse this, I think it's clear. <clears throat> well, this is our notebook. Uh, what is a notebook? Well, a notebook is kind of a book where we have included a lot of information, some images and text explaining a lot of things. And from time to time, uh, we will find this kind of cells. These cells are brought in Python language. Python is, is a programming language, a high level programming language, very famous. So these cells, you can run these cells by as you can see here by clicking this play button uh, here. So you can click here and here is running the cell. And now when you see a number in this little box, the, uh, the cell is, has finished. You can see it has some time to, to run. That, that appears an asterisk, but it's very fast. But, uh, well, this is, so all the tutorial, as you will see, is all the same, text and cells, text and cells. So we'll go over this, uh, not very fast, uh, and, and you will see how it works. Well, uh, uh, as anyone knows, <laughs> we are in a tutorial about Africa. So for this tutorial, we we, we have selected just a, a specific region of Africa, which is the system of uh, Angola Bengala current. Uh, we think it's a very interesting oceanographic system with lots of features uh, as the Bengala current. It's located, this, this area is located in, as you probably know, in the southwest coast of, of Africa. And it's, it's affected by the Bengala current, which is the closer of the subtropical gyre in the South Pacific, South, South Atlantic, I'm sorry. And we also have uh, two important currents, the Agulas current that comes from the other side of, of the continent. You have a very strong uh, current of, of Western coast, of Western margin, Ocean Western margin. And we also have the, the current, the South Equatorial current that brings very warm, uh, High, high temperature water to this Angola region. And here in the Namibia and South Africa coast, we have a parallel uh, current to the coast and a parallel wind to the coast. So as usually happens in these cases, uh, we have a very wet week. Uh, one of the most, uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, welling regions in the world one of the fourth biggest uh, welling regions. And this also, this situation or this, the combination of these currents, these different water masses creates two fronts, two frontal regions, the Angola Bengala front and the, the front of the Agulas current, right? Uh, well, we are going to spend some time in this case, in this beginning tutorial, we are not focusing uh, so much in, in the, in the 
description of this region, we are going to focus our attention on how to get the data and how to open the data, the Copernicus marine data, to, uh, to see, to have a, a first view of, of the, these features. Well, we can continue. Uh, well, uh, here I ha we have a, a cell, a code cell. As I said, well, we ran this, we already ran this cell, we can run again this cell. Yeah, probably the people who knows about Python will know that first thing you have to, to do in Python is defining what kind of libraries are you using because Python is quite a, like a like a calculator, for example. Let's make an example. Example is very simple. For example, we can create here a cell. Python is like a calculator, simple calculator. For example, you can write two plus three and you can run this cell. And obviously the response is five. It's quite simple, but uh, you can also create variables, right? Like for example, number equals to five. So you, if you or equals to six, if you run this cell, you will realize, well, this doesn't, and you print number, and you will see that, well, you get a six, what is quite obvious, but uh, you can also say, what, uh, what if I put number plus two? Uh, I can run this and I get an eight, obviously. Number is six and uh, I add two to the number, so uh, I get an eight. Well, uh, this is a very simple example, but if you want to, to go deeper with uh, doing uh, more complex things with Python, you always need to, I can delete this though, you, you always need to get uh, libraries. Libraries is what in Python allows you to, to do complex things because Python in the, 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 the first layer of Python is quite simple. You, you have um, possibilities of do many things, but you, you cannot do so much things. So when you want to, to do uh, complex things, you need to import libraries here. Uh, easily in Python, we, we write what libraries are going to use, are you going to use in the first lines of your program. So here we have the list of, uh, of libraries we are using. The first library is just to, to avoid the warning messages, so we will forget it. And we are using a library called NumPy, XRI, Matplotlib, and Cartopy. Well, here you have the, the, the links to the the links to the to the documentation of any library for example you can click here <clears throat> and you go directly to the library and to the documentation of the library so you can get all the information the deep information of each library <clears throat> but i will tell you as there is a sort of information numpy is a is a library <clears throat> devoted for scientific computation. So this library is, is uh, this library is uh, giving you options to use complex uh, mathematical functions like uh, the logarithms, uh, the square root, uh, and also you can you can use arrays, multidimensional arrays, etc. We are going to use also XRI, which is a, a, a library very related with NumPy. And is, we are going to use this, uh, this library to open and man, uh, manage the, the NetCDF uh, book and the NetCDF files that are downloaded from Copernicus. And we are going to use Matplotlib and Cartopy Matplotlib is a library for plotting for any kind of plots. You can plot whatever you want and from a scatter plot, an histogram, or any kind of mathematical plot, scientific plot. 
And also Cartopy is an extension of Matplotlib library that is devoted to, to make plots uh, projected over, over maps. So you will need uh, some kind of geographical projection like Mercator or any other. <clears throat> so Cartopy is the library that allows you to, to, these, to these kind of works. Uh, as you can see, we are importing the library and after the importing, we are using a surname, XMP, XR, MPL. So from now on, now on, this is the name we are using to refer these libraries. So now, now on, when we write something like NP dot whatever, we are referencing to a function that is included in this library, right? Well, uh, after that, uh, let's go. We have uh setting up the, the the python environment and what we need now is some data to, to start working right <laughs> so uh, there is many ways uh, for example and i uh, previously explained how to download uh, data from from copernicus and i think it, there was a question in the in the the chat asking about how can I visualize the data once they are downloaded? What so well, we are in that part. We are now, uh, there is, for example, there is in this example, we are going to focus on this Copernicus product, global analysis and forecast, physical. And this is the web page of the product, and you can see that we have the, the the window to explore the product in MyOcean. Here you have the links, very important links of the user manual and the quality information document. These are the links for the um, high level information of any product. There, these links in this document you will get. The, the more the specific the very specific information of any product uh, how is it created what are is what kind of products are used can kind of models uh, observations etc and here you have a summary of the of the information of the data you can download from from this product for example you can the id very important is a numerical model uh, the spatial coverage that is the world the spatial resolution this is quite interesting for models because as you probably know the models have a specific uh, mesh so this is the resolution of their grid uh, the temporal coverage the temporal resolution levels and the variables you can access with this product this is very interesting because here you can find the variables or you can know if the pro this product fits into your interest or into to your requirements right so with these buttons you can you can select the data you need etc and you can select the, the the temporal the temporal extension you need the, the depths the the window you want or the the product and i is explain it is this code you can see here hourly data daily data monthly data for currents for salinity for temperature etc well, uh, we are not going to spend much time, time in, in this now because we are assuming that uh, you can download this data and we have here in the, the, in the Jupyter Hub, in your tutorial, you have the, the folder data where we have some files, some example files that you can use, uh, that we can use for this example. So all uh, downloaded from using these these web pages. So uh, we we encourage a user with this information. He can uh, try to download these files, download uh, this product for with this data set. As you can see, we are downloading daily data sets for this window for this uh, in latitude and longitude for this depth and also we are using just one level of depth 
And well, we have the, we'll see later, we have downloaded a month of data that any user can do download a period of time that he likes, for example, for a few days, a week, two weeks, or can, he can follow this, this exercise without any problem. And well, uh, here we have another code cell. You can see here what we have is uh, two, kind, two, two strings of characters that are assigned to, to a variable, temp f name and cur f name. This is just uh, uh, an association of the path of any of the data we, uh, we are going to use in this example. And we are associating these uh, these names to the these variables. So from now on, for example, we can run this cell because, as you can see, this cell is not run yet. Okay. And if we create a new cell here, if we print a temp f name and we run this cell we get the name of the file and the path of the file we, we have under this variable, right? It's simple. Well, so we are going to continue. We have our data. We have the setup of uh, Python. We can start work right now, okay? So the first thing we have to do is opening our one data set, for example. To do that, uh, we use, as I said before, we use a library XRI. It's a library that, uh, that as I said before, we are uh, contracting to XR. So we are using XR dot a function, the XRI that is open that date set. You can see here this sentence. Um, when we are after Opening opening that set that date set uh, what the date set do we have to open so after that we have to include the, the name of the file we want to open this is the file name the temperature file name file name and well this sentence just uh, writes uh, let's run and we will see what hub do that sentence click on it and you can see when we put this sentence what we receive from this is a quite report a little report of the information stored in this in this type um, data set uh, as you can see the result of this sentence has been assigned to this variable so now we can access the information of this file accessing this through this variable. We can refer to this variable to, to get the data in this file, right? Mm, well, when we print this variable, we get this, and well, I don't know how much re, uh, knowledge about the NetCTF format you have. So I'm going to explain a little bit about NetCDF. The NetCDF files are a kind type of files very used for, for, for storing geophysical information uh, in a funny type uh, for meteorology, for oceanography. And this kind of files has three types of objects, let's say, three types of uh, elements which are variables, dimension, and attributes. For example, uh, we can start explaining, for example, you can see here in the report, we have attributes, dimensions, and despite of here, we have coordinates, coordinates and data variables. These two uh, elements are actually variables, are the same, but they have little differences, but they are variables. Let's start with the attributes. The these are the global attributes of that affects the, the, the file. So here, if you open these attributes, you can see some information about the, the file. Is, sometimes there is not much in, important information in here, but maybe you can get the information of what kind of product are you downloading or are you working of where it has been downloaded, etc. And here we have the dimensions, which, have, which here 
which are just the name of the variables that will be used as dimensions. Well, these dimensions you probably will see that are replicated in coordinates. As I said before, coordinates are kind of variables. The variables in an etcdf file are the, the elements that really stores the data. They are not devoted to, to, to describe the data. They are devoted to store the data. So when you want to, to access the data, you have to access the coordinates or the variables itself. And here we can see that coordinates are one dimensional variables that stores the values of the different dimensions. You can see here we have a file with 32 depth levels, uh, 300 latitude uh, values, uh, 34 uh, values of time, elements of time, and 2200, uh, 241 elements of, of longitude. So, well, uh, if we click here, we can get a report, a sort report. These are called the attributes of this variable. These attributes are really interesting so many times because you can get the, the minimum value of the, of the variable, the maximum value of the variable. As you can see here, we are talking about the dimension depth. So in depth, uh, we have but uh, values that goes from 0.5, let's say, up to 500 meters, more than 500 meters, is expressed in meters. And um, well, uh, this is the information, and you can click here. You can have some information of the specific values. In this case, you can see the values specific. And well, for example, we can go over the report of the time to see the to see the attributes. Well, it's uh, maybe this time we have the minimum and the value, but but in real in, in the file, and these values are hours since this date. So we can go over the data directly to see that in this file we have data from <clears throat> from April twenty twenty three up to 4th of May, uh, 2023, right? And well, once we have seen the variables, the, the coordinates, that which are one dimensional variable, we can go over the real data. You can see here in the variables are not one dimensional variables. They are, in this case, it has four dimensions. So here we have set out, let's go over the report to see this variable stores values of temperature for this fourth variable vari uh, dimensions. And well, here we can see that first dimension is time, depth, latitude, longitude. So these dimensions are these dimensions. So we have here values of temperature for this for this block of the ocean for this period we have defined it, right? So how can we access this data through the using the Python? Well, we can I read bright wrote here some examples. Uh, for example, maybe this is clearer. When you can you can access, for example, a variable, like for example, the dimension, you can write. The temperature, yes, as you can see, when we have opened the file, we created this variable, the temperature, and this is our handle for this the data inside of, of this file name, right? So we to access a variable, we just we can write temperature DS yes, uh, and we can include the name of the variable between brackets in here, so with this command, we are accessing the the, the variable time in the in the file, as you can see here. As you can see here, every variable and every dimension has its own name, depth, latitude, time, and longitude, and set out. So this is the name we use to access this specific uh, array of data, right? So we can where we can we write this command, we will get a this 
displaying a display of this specific. I'm gonna comment this just a second. When we run this, we are getting well, uh, a display of this variable inside the file. Well, we, we have the, the report of the time variable inside the inside the, the file. For example, let's comment this. Uh, it didn't talk about this or any line that starts with this symbol is a comment. Is a comment, so the, the system doesn't take, take it into account as an order or a comment. So you can comment any lines and uh, see what is doing that line, or you can remove lines without without removing actually removing them. So here we have another way to access the data. What if we want to uh, access a list of attributes of one variable? What, well, what we can do is, for example, here we have the name of the data set, the data set, uh, the name of the variable, and after that, we can write a dot attributes, right? So if we run this, with this, we are getting the list of attributes of this variable latitude, right? Uh, valid mean, valid max, etc. Let's comment this again, uh, let's uncomment this. And well, uh, this example uh, is actually two examples together, this one and this one. And what if I want to, to print a specific attribute? I've seen that there is many attributes here in for any variable, but what if I want to print, for example, just the valid max? Well, so for global attributes, we can access the again the the, the file with with its name uh, with its handle, and well, since we are not accessing any variable, the specific variable, we can uh, skip this the definition of the variable, and after after that, we can put attributes with the name of the of the attribute I want we want to. Put to print, or uh, for the case of variables, attributes, we do the, almost the same, but we have to define the, the name of the variable we want to print, right? So if I run this, well, we can get for the global attribute of uh, temperature, yes, of title is, this is the title, you can see. And here, for example, if we want to access what is what are the units of temperature in the file, well, we can write this, this, and we will get this information, right? So with this, we we are able to to access the data, and we are able to navigate through the data. But well, now we have some knowledge and we are some power of the of the over the data it's time to start plotting things right which are actually the, the most interesting thing probably well uh, let's see my let's start with with an example of how to plot maps of of temperature uh, for example uh, first so the first thing you will see in this tutorial that we are going to to do for any kind of plots, we are going to use two kind of two steps. Let's say uh, they are two steps. The first step is a step where we are selecting the specific data we we want to we want to use, and the second step is a step where we are plotting the map, the map or the figure, right? So why do we do this? Uh, let's imagine we have here. We have a we have a file with four dimensional array. How can we plot a map from a four dimensional array? Uh, well, we cannot plot uh, maps of four dimensional data, right? We have to select just a slice of data that includes latitude and longitude data. So to do that, we will need to select a specific depth. And we will need also to select a specific 
a period, a, a specific date, right? So this is what we are doing here. Uh, you can see here we are uh, uh, assigning the value of the date we want to plot and the depth we want to plot. And we are using a function, uh, yeah, a function called cell that is uh, that is included in, in in XRI. So when we access the data file and the variable in the data file and we write cell, we can select a specific values inside the inside the variable. So uh, here we are defining that we just want the depth equals to depth, which is zero, and we want the the period of time that is equal to date, which is this date. And well, we are using the method nearest. That means that we are looking for the closest period to these to these requirements. Yeah, and with this variable, just uh, removes uh, the the collapses the the dimensions with 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 just one value. Um, will, we will see this later. We can run this cell, and well, we have again uh, we at, uh, we assign this this selection of data to a new variable that I have called temperature to map. This is the temperature we want to, to, uh, to plot, right? So this is the variable we want to plot. As you can see here, right now, we just have two dimensions, latitude and longitude, so we can plot uh, up with two dimensions, right? And we, we desire the data of temperature. And here we still have the coordinates, the, variable, the dimensions, the coordinates, etc as in the main uh, file. But here, the important is that we have, we have uh, these, these uh, slides, this, um, this style of data for, and we can use this data for plot a map. Uh, well, if we remove this, just to understand what is doing this squeeze. If we remove this and, and run again, again the, the code, you can see that we will get a three-dimensional array, but one of the, of the values of the dimension is equals to one. So when, when we use this squeeze option, I, I will run it. What a squeeze does is to remove all dimensions with size equal to one, right? Well, it's it's better later to when we want we go over the functions of plotting to to have to work with arrays with just two dimensions, not three. Um, well, after this, we go over the the block where we are plotting the the or map. This well could we complex for people who is not very related with Python, but is I would say that in the, uh, the if we can think on this as objects, it's quite simple. What we are doing here with these comments is there is four uh, four um, sections in this in this cell. First, we are creating the, the figure. In the, in the world of informatics, we are creating an object uh, that is a figure with some, uh, this is the figure. And as usually from now on, we will refer to this figure with this name. Uh, we are creating creating an axis into the, into the figure. And since this axis are axis uh, that will be plotted in a map, we need to define a uh, uh, projection. Oops, I'm sorry. We have to define the, the geographical projection we are using. After this, we have a block that is editing the addition of the basic features of the map. And after that, we will go with some commands to plot the data. And finally, we will finish the edition of the of the figure. Right. Well, in this second, we have already explained this this first 
this first uh, block. Once we have the figure and the axis in the figure, we can start to modify the figure and the axis. So for, with these commands, we are including some uh, features in the, in the axis and in the figure. For example, with these commands, what we are doing is at coast lines in the figure and with this, um, uh, for example, this is interesting, the land feature. With this, we are uh, including a land mask. Maybe it's better if we continue and after that we can run the plot and um, we will see what is are doing these lines. And here is the, the most, probably the most important uh, command, which is the plot, the command that uses the function p color mesh that creates p color mesh. Uh, you can follow the, the documentation of p color mesh. It's, it's a function, a matplotlib function that creates a pseudo color plot. Uh, with this, we can function, you can create a a uh, pseudo color plot is actually is you can you get every pixel so for to every value of the pixel you are seeing a specific color and when you use a uh, function in python you just have to give to the function the specific values in this order that the function needs for this case we we have to assign to the to the function this uh, the data of latitude, you can see temp to data. I would say we, we said before that temp to data is the data we are going to plot. We are accessing the specific values of longitude in the temp to data to map, sorry. And we are with this, we are accessing the specific values of latitude in or, or array. And we are. At, with this, we are accessing the values of temperature, the specific values, right? And what this, I, I will explain later, which is this, uh, this is the type of, of uh, color map. And finally, in the last, uh, in the last uh, block, we have also some editing commands, like, like including some title in the, in the figure, and also including the, the, the color map, the specific color bar. So let's run this and let's see what, what do we get. Well, here it is, our first map in Python. Uh, well, you can see here, uh, I, I included this map, very, very big map, because I wanted just, just to include, you can see that in this map, uh, we can see almost half of the continent. Uh, and this region is the region where we have data, right? I wanted to edit this in this way because I wanted to, to give some um, framework information uh, for people. Maybe there is people that, that is listening is not very related with the region we are working on. So I focus, I just wanted to, to plot this map this way to see what region in the world we are right now working, right? Well, this is our working area. This is the area where we are, where we have data, and this is the rest of the Africa. That probably, where if you are, if we are working with data, we don't want to, to plot uh, the half of the continent, <laughs> right? So uh, this is because I've included this line, this comma line here in the editing, but. Uh, Editing of the features of the map, you can see that is defined the extent of the map, including uh, the minimum and maximum longitude and the minimum and la maximum latitude. We can just remove this line. So if we run again this cell, well, we get a map that is adjusted to the extension we we are we are plotting, we are interested in, right? It's much better. So, but it's interesting to see that this, what is the, what is the purpose of this kind of lines? Is, is this kind of things, for example, you are defining, for example, the extension of the map, 
or you are, uh, uh, you are including the borders of the countries, for example, which, uh, I encourage any, any user, he can play with this. For example, if you can know what, if you want to know what is this line doing, you can just include the line as a comment and run again the, the thought. And what happened here? What, uh, as you can see, the difference as is that you probably, uh, we, we don't uh, have a field, uh, we, we haven't filled the, the, the continent. So we have some a white continent. For example, we're gonna run again. Or for example, you want to know what is what would we do in this line? Let's imagine. Well, well, we can run again. We can comment this line and run again. And as you can see here, the, the result of removing this line is that our color bar has disappeared, right? Here. After the plotting of the map, I've included some exercises for the users. Uh, it's just to to have um, uh, to to promote some thinking about what we are doing and we are uh, we are seeing. Uh, well, uh, the most important <laughs> plotting maps is not just plotting maps. It's first. Uh, see what is in the map, right? So let's see what actually is in this map. You can see here the signal of cool water close to the, to the coast of Namibia, to the coast of South Africa. This is the signal of the upwelling region of, of, this, of this region. And here in temperature, we also have a river, a clear river uh, of temperature. That, is uh, related with the with the current of Agulas current, and we also have some views of the importance of the um, of the water of the dome of uh, Angola. So you can see there is very hot water in this region. So there is a frontal region right here, and also a frontal region that appears in this in this line. Well, uh, coming back to the exercises, uh, yeah, I just I propose to the user you can try to do it, and I think they are not very difficult. So I encourage anyone to to do it. Uh, yeah, just try to modify the the code, uh, modify the lot long limits of the plot to create a map focus in a specific region. Well, this is something that we have ex already explained it because you have this line. So you have to uncomment this line and use it, use these uh, parameters to focus or your attention in any place of the map where you, you think you, you could be interesting. Uh, well, we can, how another exercise, another proposed exercise is let's change the plotting depth. How would you explain the appearance of data with depth? Uh, well, how would you change the, we are, we, right now we are plotting that you can see here. We are plotting the depth equals to zero, but let's imagine we want to plot, for example, 200 meters depth. Can run always. We have to be careful because our main file has data from yes, from surface to 500 meters. If we ask for a deeper layer, we won't get information about beyond that limit. For example, so we can change the depth to to 200 meters. And we can run this. And this is an interesting result, probably. We are asking for data at 200 meters. But if we go here to see the, the real depth of our data, data is 186 meters. Why is this happening? Well, because probably if we go here to the main mine file, 
And let's see the depth variable. This is quite difficult to see here. But here, here is the value of, of 186 meters. And the next value of, of depth is 222, right? So since we are using here uh, the nearest method, the system is looking for the value of depth closer to this requested value. So it finds that the value of 186 is closer than the other one. So for that reason, we are getting this information. This has a little bit dangerous because it's quite nice. You won't get any error with this nearest method, method, but let's imagine we are looking for uh, a value of, of depth, uh, this is too much, but let's imagine we ask for a value of depth of 2000 meters and we run the solve. Well, there is no error at all, so it works fine, but uh, despite you are thinking, you probably are thinking that you are working with that data of 2000 meters depth, uh, you actually are working with data at 500 meters because this is the closer value in your in your data set, right? So let's imagine we want to to use 200 meters, and once we have defined it and we have selected our data to 200 meters, we can run again our code here, and this is what we get. This is the values of temperature at 200 meters, right? Uh, you can see here, there is a question that something that rises is that there is a lot of um, values here that um, doesn't appear, are missing. And well, where are they, why are they missing? This is clearly because, clearly because uh, we are in a deeper layer. So the coastline doesn't apply in this, in this, uh, these depths so the bathymetry is more like this than the coastline at zero meter depth right uh, finally I, we, I propose to to modify the color scale uh, of the map using other color scales from this documentation here you can see the, the color scales there are lots of different color scales you can select any color scales you you want for your plots we are using this one yet which is quite common to use this but well we could use for example another one like uh, let's imagine we want to use this since we are using temperature we could use this one so I, we can use hot uh, color scale so we can change here and see map instead of putting see map. Uh, we can write hot. All right. Again, the, the soul. So you get this is quite alarming map <laughs> but well this is the color scale we have selected and then there is something that maybe seems to be wrong here let's go back to zero meter steps and run and rerun this again we come back to surface and looking to this map we could find that there is something wrong that well, we said that our temperature was cooler here, but right, the color seems to be more associated to, to very high temperatures, right? Actually, the, the color scale is inverse, reversed. And well, there is a little tip about the color scales in this kind of color scales. In any color scales you use, you can include an underscore R. So, with this R, you are reversing your color scale. And well, with this, we have the color scale in the direction we, we are interested in, right? 
Well, this is well. Finally, we have our map. We we know how to change some things in maps. So I encourage to any user to change things here to to see what is the result in the, the map, and we can go a little bit beyond uh, because we are plotting scalar values. But what if we want to plot a vectoral value, for example? Uh, for example, the currents would be very interesting. How could we do with currents? Well, let's see. Let's start a new example. To the, for this example, we are opening a new dat data set. You can see we are using this function that we already explained before, but we are opening <coughs> the file, file associated to the currents, right? And we are creating, creating a new variable that is current it's it, that's it, right? So we can run this. <clears throat> and again, we, we get the report of the data we have. And as you can see here, we have a report that is almost the same than before. We have dimensions, attributes, and variables. In coordinates, we have one-dimensional variables, which are the actually the dimensions. <clears throat> and in variables, we have ops two variables. We don't have one variable than like before. We have two variables. And if we explore these variables, we realize that there is VO, which is a V component of the of the velocity of the current velocity. Uh, this component is oriented in the north south axis. And where is the other one? Ah, the other one, the U O O variable is the, the U component of the velocity that is oriented in the in the direction of east west. Right, both of them are uh, measured in these units meters per second. And um, well, uh, this we have we will have to work with two variables, not one like before. And um, something that uh, arises here is that oh well, these are the dimensions of our data set. We have one value of depth. Oops, this is different than before. Uh, we have almost the same latitude, time, and longitude values, but we just have one value of depth. So this that data set doesn't include information in deeper layers. It just includes information in, in surface. Well, this is just because we have decided to select when we are downloading the data, we have decided, well, we can save some space in our computer. So we can just select a layer we want to use and we will get a, a lighter files here, right? So once we have opened the, we are going to, to do almost the same than before. Uh, so we are, you open in the, uh, the file, the data set we are using, the data set we are using. After that, we are selecting the data we are we want to use. And after that, we are defining the block of code we are going to use. It's almost the same than before, it's very simple. We already have our data set open. So from here, we can uh, select the data, obviously, since we are working right now with two values of, of two variables, we have to select, we have to, to write two orders to open both uh, variables, to, to select both variables. And as before, we are make, using the cell function, selecting the time we want to use, but as you can see here in comparison with with what we did before, there is not selection of depth in here. And what is this? Why, why is this? Uh, this is because just as I before, uh, before we are using a, a file with just one depth. So we don't need, we don't, 
we don't need to define a specific depth because the depth is the depth <laughs> is the depth that we have in the file right so we don't need to specific any depth here because this is, there is just one value and well we can run this um well i am just print here that one of the variables uh, the v component and um, well we we get this uh, which is important is we have a variable with two dimensions which is very important for to plot a map because we cannot plot maps with more dimensions and these are the coordinates uh, the depth value of is about half a meter latitude time and longitude the time is the time we have selected by the fourth and well this is the component v but we could also print the component u and we jump into the next cell the, the cell where we are we are plotting the map these cells are always a little bit more complicated that science here we are also using something that is very convenient in, in convenient in programming language we are using a function we are creating our own, our own function to plot things uh, and the, what is this uh, function well science we write this line up to we write this return everything is tapped here so every this code is stored in this function. So this function is a way to, to pack a, a list of commands inside uh, just one inside just one command, one order. So we are defining a function. You can see here the name of the function is plot magnitude map. So when from now on, since we have already loaded our function in the memory of the system, we will be able to plot maps just using this function. Uh, we will plot, we will write plot magnitude maps with the specific uh, parameters we have to use, the component u, the component v, and the title of the plot. And the, the function will do the same, the, the rest of the things will. So with this, we are able to, we are able to, to pack the information, the code in inside a function. This function is almost the same that we have done before with temperature. You can see there is a first block of two for the creation of the figure, a second block for the addition, the addition of the figure, a block for comma uh, for plotting and a final block for the final edition that, that includes the color bar and the title etc but this function has some one just one difference with the code we saw before in, in the case of temperature which is this line this is line is uh, since we are working with components we cannot plot the the, the magnitude of of uh, of uh, current speed because we need the magnitude of the current speed and right now we have to transform the, uh, the components into the magnitude so what is that is is what we are doing with this we are using the square root square of of the function of root square from numpy to, to compute the root square of u uh, times two, etc. We are. This is a bit clearer. With this formula, we are computing the we are computing the magnitude, and we are not plotting the components. We have to plot the speed, right? So we use the longitude of the speed, the latitude of the speed, etc. Right? We use this color map, as you will see. It's not the like the previous one, but at the end, well, we get this. We we get a map of the current speed in meters per second. Uh, you can see here we have we have a map of the Agulhas current, where the Agulhas current is really really clear, and also we have 
uh, interesting current here, but this is not actually what we wanted from the beginning. We, in the beginning, we wanted a map of vectors, not a map of an escalar. This is not a vector, right? So um, let's imagine how can we change this function. We have defined it this function, which is nice to plot the, the speed. Uh, let's imagine how can we change this function to 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 include in this map uh, also the vectors, right? So this is what we have done doing in this in this cell. As you can see here, again, we define a, a new function which is plot vector map. Um, in this function is almost the same than the previous one with the figure creation, the addition of the figure, some commands to plot the data. And in these commands to plot the data, we have plotting the magnitude as with the calculation of speed like before, right? But after this, in this, in this block of the commands to plot the data, we are including these commands to plot the vectors. This is to do that. We are using the quiver, uh, the quiver function from Matplotlib. Here you should have the link for the documentation of quiver. Uh, the quiver is just a function devoted to plot vectors in maps in, in any in any plot. So you, the parameters you have to give it to quiver is the values of the position of vectors and also the values of the components of the vectors, right? So it's, that's what we are doing here. We are passing to the quiver function. First, the position in the U direction, the latitude, the position in longitude, and also the, the components V and U, right? And what is are doing this comment here? What is its purpose? Well, this is a little bit difficult to explain right now. So we will skip this by now and we will explain later when we see the result of this map. Um, well, the final block is just to add the titles and the titles and the layout of the map. So we can run this. Sorry yes. to interrupt you, um, Alvaro, just to let you know that uh, it's now one hour in. You are uh, already for an hour in. Just okay. keep track of that. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> With this, we are well, we are plotting this, this map of vectors. With the, the current, the Agula scoring is very, very clear. And it's, uh, it's showing the direction of the vectors and with colors, we are showing also the, the, the speed of the, the speed of the current. And also it's interesting to see uh, what is the purpose of this skip parameter. Uh, with these uh, variables, we are, with this selection of data, we are, <clears throat> We are selecting some data inside the inside the data. You can see this variable skip is included in the as a parameter in the function, and this skip is this value actually five. What let's imagine that we do not skip values in the normal when we run the the cell. We would obtain this, which is quite messy because obviously there is a lot of vectors plot here because the resolution of the product is very, very high. So we will get this mesh that is not very helpful at all. So to plot this, we should uh, find uh, an equilibrium between how many vectors we can skip. Because for example, if we plot 25, uh, we skip 25 elements. We, we are plotting every 25 element, we obtain this, which is actually also not very convenient because they are very few vectors. It's better to find an equilibrium between too much and too many. And for example, five is, I think is quite nice, right? Uh, well, this, uh, yes, there is a final example, uh, which is animate maps. This example, I think it's not very, it's interesting, obviously, but uh, it is just uh, to make an animation of different maps of velocity. Uh, you can run the 
example, very fast. Uh, we are doing exactly the same than before. We are, you can see, we are selecting the data for a period of time. We are making a plot, uh, a loop uh, for, to do, to make many plots. You can see we are using the function we defined before. So we can run this and this is creating some figures here in the, the figures directory. There should be appear here. Way is uh, there is a way to refresh this? And well, um, after we have created these figures and this path, I don't know why this is this is these are not appearing here. We use some Pythonic functions, not very related with Copernicus Marine, to to make a, a GIF animation. So well, we can run this and we get this is a speed or animation for a period of time, right? Well, this is the finishing of the course. Uh, well, this is the final exercise. I think it's quite difficult for beginners. Uh, well, it's to create an animation of SST for a period of time, but we are we, I encourage you to 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 face this exercise, I think it's feasible. And this is the conclusion, right? Great, thank you very much, Alvaro. I think it was very much appreciated by the comments I've seen <laughs> on the chat. I think uh, Sorry it was really nice and also the, no, no, it was perfect. The pace was also very good. I think it was a, a nice pace. <laughs> I have already a few questions for you if you're happy to answer them. And um, so just to remind everyone, uh, even if you're not able to follow uh, what Alvaro was showing us, you will be able to see it later on. And um, okay, can you maybe see my screen very slowly? So some of the questions are a bit general, but uh, yeah, it would still uh, be nice for you to, yeah. <laughs> you can ad you address whatever you, <laughs> you're able to. Um, can we do the tutorial in Google Collab? Well, right now, not. Uh, the answer is not. Actually, I, I am not very sure what is Google Collab. I, I don't know if it is some kind of uh, programming languages or... I think so. Yeah, I think so. But I'm also not 100% sure. <laughs> in, uh, right in, now, in which the, way? it is not. Uh, for sure, it is not available. We can think on that for future... For future um, training courses or for mm -hmm. future tutorials. It would be interesting, right? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I guess the, the best uh, option would be to, just like you explained it, right, to download um, and work on your own Jupyter environment. Um, yeah. Great. And uh, the next one. Oh, so uh, what is the difference between downloading the data from Jupyter Lab and MyOcean platform? Or some data sets are not available on MyOcean platform. No, no, no. Uh, every every data set is available in both platforms. Platforms, but the difference is that mm, well, today I just uh, show the beginning of the path. Uh, uh, Python is a very very powerful tool, so if you are interested in just uh, just uh, the visualization of data, maybe it's okay with. For your purposes, maybe it's okay for with my ocean platform, but the the real interest of using Python, I think, is that you can make very 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 complex uh, analysis and you can start to to use uh, complex mathematical tools to make an analysis of the data. Maybe in the next in the next uh, tutorial. We, we have seen now, right now, we have seen just the beginning, which is the access to the data and the first visualization. But in the next tutorial, maybe it's a bit complicated for, for many people, but but you can see the, the, the real power of this tool. There is a, a option to make a complex mathematical analysis of the data, so you can plot uh, variables that are not actually stored in the in the platform. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, so a question between um, MATLAB and Python, which one is more effective and easy for ocean data analysis? 
Well, if you, if you have experience with it, MATLAB, <laughs> it, it's quite polemic because surely it, it, oh. there will be a lot of people that will defend MATLAB or Python. Yeah. So, okay, so... we don't want to start a war now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and R, yeah. there's also R that can come in the but end. Just I would say that uh, the main difference between MATLAB and Python, they would have many differences in computational approach, but uh, MATLAB is a, a property code. So you have to pay for the for the for the license for a license of MATLAB. You should mm -hmm. do it. Not free. Uh, but in the case of Python, it's an open source uh, system that you can just download and use it. And so this is the, from my point of view, the the, the power of the Python in front of MATLAB. In terms <laughs> of computational efficiency, maybe MATLAB is uh, a bit more efficient but oh, yeah, this has the advantages. It's, uh, advantages and disadvantages i guess yeah <laughs> yes thank you and um uh can we change the bathymetry uh of the maps the I, uh, of, I, I don't know? understand very well how could we change we can plot mm. the bathymetry actually my my partner Stefania will show the, the bathymetry of maps in a few minutes. You, you can change it as, as soon as you can change any data you have in, in your database, but uh, I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not very sure what means change. The yes, bathymetry. yeah, exactly. Um, you can plot the bathymetry and you can get the bathymetry and get the data and see the data. And, but the data is already how how it is, so you can it, that would mean change the data, right? Or have yeah. all the data. Um, and one last question: How can we copy this script to one file that can be executed later, or uh, on our own hard disk? I tried to do a simple copy paste, but it does not work. Yeah, I I think uh, it would be interesting to if. You are user to work with Jupyter Notebooks. You can download the Jupyter the Jupyter system and install your the Jupyter system in your in your in your laptop or in your PC in your computer. So you can run the, the you can run the exercises and you can run, run your own code. So this is another reason because I wanted to to include some functions. Maybe it's a bit uh, a bit more obscure if we write things in functions. But the good thing in functions is that you can copy that part and put it in your code in your in your Jupyter system, and it will work. The function is is like a cell, so it works. Uh, it's independent of the rest of the code. Okay, so it it would be possible to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, actually, is a video that we should um, make some days how to install Jupyter in your own in your own platform. Yeah. So you can run really the first your steps. own platform. The 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 tutorial. Um, Actually, I think we already have one, but maybe Cedric can uh, confirm or Anaïs. Ah. Uh, from the user support team, I think we, we have a, a beginner guide to to the Jupyter lab. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but maybe uh, Anaïs or Cedric, if you're there, you can confirm that. Uh, yes, there are different uh, online resources to, uh, to have users on this uh, on this topic. On the Jupyter uh, lab, yeah. right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I saw Elena, Elena on one of these yeah. videos. Um, I will actually share it uh, here. <laughs> Thank you, Cedric. Um, great. And oh, I think there's also another question, but um, I cannot display it in full screen. Uh, can the Jupyter lab script also be run in Spider? Our local internet yeah. speed uh, is slow, so Jupyter often lags. Thus, on an cool. offline program like Spider, would works better. Well, you can get the the cell codes. You can copy the cell codes and no, paste in a in a script for for a spider, and it should work for sure. Uh, it's important to to take in consideration the, the libraries you have already installed in in your system in the spider. 
because as you know if you are working with a spider you probably know that before using a library like like cartopipe for example you need to previously install the library but the the internet is full of uh, of information of how to install this kind of libraries in your system thank you and uh, i think we did this one oh, yeah one last one um how to plot the seasonal maps with ocean currents oh uh, very interesting <laughs> uh i think i i I would say that to this to anonymous it has no name uh, that <laughs> uh, that in the next in the next tutorial we are going to to compute the monthly means of of data for for a period of time and we have we are going to work with a very long uh, i think one or two years of data and we are going to compute the monthly means of the, those data. So at the end, the seasonal, the, the computing of seasonal values is almost the same. It's, it's, it's not computing monthly values, it's, it's computing three monthly values. So uh, well, uh, later in the next tutorial, I will make a little, a little comment about how can we do this and how can we plot this, actually. OK, oh, great. Um... So yes, we are good for our questions for now. And um, yes, so it's now 12.15. Um, I'm not sure how much time you had reserved for the intermediate uh, uh, tutorial, Alvaro. Um, uh, well, <laughs> we're going to start with the intermediate tutorial and... and I can well, stop you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, no worries. I mean, uh, uh, we Actually, can, can... in the intermediate tutorial, I want to spend so much time on explaining the environment and etc. Sure, so, yeah. So, so yeah, don't worry. I will stop you then whenever we are running out of time. And we can always uh, get on our break. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we will just continue. Great. Thanks a lot. And um, whenever you want. <laughs> Let me share my screen again. You have to Great. Screen, I think. Yes. Well, this is a, a tutorial we ran before. I, I'll try to go a little bit faster. So now we are going, going to close this tutorial and we are going to start with the next one, which is the intermediate tutorial. <clears throat> Here, uh, this tutorial is devoted to, to give to the users some tools for to manage for tools uh, for management that could be applied for fisheries for example or for coastal management so in this tutorial we are going to focus in the analysis of analysis of surface temperature and this is done uh, oriented focused in the analysis of the of the upwelling system so we are going to provide an analysis of the upwelling system oriented a little bit to find regions where the upwelling are more active so so uh, so it would be could be helpful for fisheries so they can find let's see later and we also we are going to see the, the waves of the region we are going to provide an analysis of the waves and why have we did, uh, have we selected the waves well because waves are one of the most important parameters that may that usually affects the human activities right and we also are going to give the, some tools for analyzing the currents in the region. So, well, let's start. Uh, this is a, just an introduction uh, that I did before, the, the Angola Bengala uh, system. Uh, well, and this is the first cell of the of the of a Python system. You probably know this what are these kind of cells for this tutorial i would say that that i will say that uh, that uh, to run these cell codes you you can click on this uh, play button so once if there is an asterisk and now there when you see a number here <clears throat> 
uh, the run has already the cell has already run and is already loaded in the memory of the system. I'm going, I'm going to collapse this. And well, uh, we have the first and uh, the first setup of the Python environment. You can see we we are using he here these libraries, the NumPy and the XRI. The NumPy library is set for mathematical computation. The XRI use it to open and manage uh, NetCDF files. And we are using three Matplotlib uh, sub, sub uh, sub uh, libraries and also we are using Cartobite to 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 plot maps again and we are using a, a new a new library which is wind rose is a simple module for to plot uh, polar rose plots uh, we will like we will see later what is this polar rose plots well in this in this tutorial, we are not using just one that's the product, Copernicus Marine product. We are using three Copernicus products. Here you can see, or you can have the, the parameters we are we have used to download it, the product, products because as in other occasions, we are not going to spend time in how in explaining how to download this data. Let's say that this data is stored directly stored in this in this directory. Um, well, in the, in this cell, we are just we can run this. We are just assigning uh, four variables and assigning the path and the name of the files we have with the data. You know, uh, we have this four data. Uh, data from temperature, the from the analysis and forecast system with one day uh, frequency. We also have data from temperature, uh, from temperature, but this is the multi-year system. This is the ray analysis with a monthly with a monthly with a monthly frequency. And we are going to use also data from the wave systems analysis and forecast in early it's not only it's three early data e from currents from the from the physical global physical model we are going to get the analysis and forecast in one day frequency right uh, first of all uh, there's a very short uh, description of what is an upwelling when we have a coast line and the wind is blowing in parallel to the coastline. Sometimes, depending on the depending on, on the hemisphere, the, the Ekman transports uh, goes uh, in a normal direction to this wind. So when we we get wind in the, for, for example, this is for the North Hemisphere. If we get a wind like this, the Coriolis effect uh, pushes the water uh, to the left. I'm oh, sorry, to the, to the right. So uh, when we have uh, we have a wind blowing parallel to the coast, we have a deflection of the water uh, away from the coast and this deflection is uh, is uh, is followed but um, a welling of deep water that comes from deeper layers that comes for, from deeper layers is it is cold water with uh, with a lot of nutrients uh, rich in nutrients etc so uh, here we are going to give some inform some tools to to analyze the temperature field for for, for oriented to 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 managing of fisheries uh, as before we are going to start opening uh, that date set uh, for example this one the temperature file and we can run this we have as before, uh, an etcdf uh, file 
in the previous in the previous tutorial I explained it what is an CDF how uh, the uh, um, I explained it also the elements we can find in the in the NIT CDF and we can make a, a first approach approach we can make a, a plot of temperature surface temperature to do that uh, we we can select uh, uh, the slice of the data as just the same than in the previous example and we once we have selected uh, a slice with with values of latitude and longitude but just two dimensions we can plot the data using a function very similar than the function we used it before in the previous example. The only difference is that, that we have included the creation of the figure and the axis outside of the of the fit of the function, right? So the function uh, gets as parameter the axis and the data data to plot and the title title, right? So we have to create, previously create outside the, the function, we have to previously create a figure and the axis with the corresponding projection, geographical projection. And we use a plot map function to create the, the map, right? We can go with this, we can run this all. Um, but this is what we get, an image of temperature like we did before, actually. Mm -hmm. It's very nice figure, but uh, well, maybe sometimes it's not enough if we are interested in, in well, how much intense is the upwelling in some specific region. Uh, well, we don't know. We can uh, we can see this image image of temperature, but it's not. Actually, the, the how much intense is the upwelling is not uh, represented here because we are having just temperature, but actually we are saying the upwelling is, is uh, strongly affected by by the seasonal uh, variability. We are not, we don't know. Maybe we could say, well, here in 25 uh, degrees latitude, we have areas with very cold water but let's say so we can as other view of the of the upwelling we can also plot sections of temperature to do that we have to make a new selection of data this is something that we have not done before here you can see we are selecting a, a range of values of longitude and since we want to plot a section of data in with depth, we are plotting, we are selecting a, a range of, of values of longitude and just a specific latitude. So we will we will get a zonal a zonal section. And with this cell, the, this two um, this command is uh, is nesting to uh, to cell functions first of all we get the information from the data file with the variable with the variable and we are selecting the range range of latitudes of latitudes to do that we use the slice function and we put the slice with the minimum value and the maximum value that are stored here in this list, right? And after that, we are including the selection of latitude and time values. You can see this. We have wrote this in this way because we think maybe it could be more clear for, for users, but this is actually... We, let me show you in this way just in case someone doesn't seem think this is more clear. Well, these two functions, these two lines are exactly the same. That's exactly the same. You can write this sentence in just one line or you can write this sentence using 
this is last at the end here to split a line in different levels and maybe I think maybe could be more uh, clear this way of writing things, but well, uh, probably well, probably is not the same for other people. So you can use the same, use a, both of them. It's exactly the same. In this case, we are using this, and with this, with this command, we are getting. You can see a, an array data data to section uh, with this with two dimensions. This time we do not have latitude and longitude as dimensions. Obviously, we have depth and longitude as dimensions. And with this code, we we can plot the, the section, right? We run the the code and let me explain you that here we are creating the figure and the axis. Uh, this is oh okay this this in this plot we are including two panels, uh, the left panel it's including just a plot of the surface temperature a map of the surface temperature. So to do that we are using this plot map function that was defined. Just before, this is a, the great power for, power of functions that once they are defined here, we do not need to write any code here. We can just plot map uh, with the axes that have been previously defined and use the data and the title, and we get our plot map. And over the plot map, we include this little plot, which is the this red line, the dotted line, a red line to 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 show where are the latitude we are selecting. And well, what is really interesting is these lines in a second subplot in the in the panel, we are including a contour, a contour plot. This is a function uh, this is a Python mat matplotlib function to plot contours like this. And we are including some uh, addition of the figure. For example, we have to invert the axis to, to find the, the higher values in the bottom and the lower values in the, in the upper uh, place. Uh, we also modify the, the background color, which is this gray color here. Uh, we also include the latitude and longitude uh, levels, and the title of the figure, and obviously the color bar, right? So we get this, this result. So what is interesting is actually more interesting is, is this. Is, well, what are we seeing the, here? Well, here we are seeing the, the, the section of temperature along this, uh, this line, right? So well, we, we get, you can see that there is the isothermal lines. And when we go closer to the coast, the, the isothermal lines uh, are curved to the surface. So this is the actual effect of the, this is the actual effect of the upwelling. The, the, the water is moving towards the inner ocean. So the deeper water is upwelling from the bottom and going to the surface. So that is, that's the reason because, because of the, this is a reason of the uh, decreasing of temperature in, in the coast, right? Uh, well, this is interesting, very interesting information. And we could run again this this code, changing the latitude and the, the longitude to to analyze to analyze the welling. But uh, from our point of view, we are still not. We can do it here, twenty five point five. We can run in the as we said before, in the twenty five degrees latitude. We can run here. What second? Well, we get this information of, of the curvature of the isothermals. So you can see that the effect of, of, of the upwelling also reaches quite depth. 
uh, up to 400 meters depth. But uh, this information doesn't give us uh, information about how how intense is the upwelling? Is the upwelling in terms of, of of productivity? That's because, as I said before, that, well, this is cool water. But according taking in consideration that the upwelling has an important uh, annual variability, seasonal variability, we should uh, we should. Uh, take this in consideration. So we can uh, consider how intense is the upwelling uh, just in terms of the taking in consideration the, the, the seasonal variability of the upwelling. To do, to do that, we are going to start working with anomalies. The definition of anomalies is just uh, the, the removal of the mean value from a data. You have a, a temporal uh, time series. You have time series, a time series. So from in the moment you get the, this time series and you remove from your series the, uh, the mean of the series, you, you transform your time series in a time series of positive and negative values that goes around your mean. That in the, that that moment your mean is is zero. So to do this, we previously we have to we have to compute the 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 mean of to to remove the mean from the time series. So we are going to use uh, another another data set, which is the data set provided by the multi-year system, a very long system. So we can get a very long period. You can see here we have 132 data for a period of from 2010 up to 2020. Well, we have 20, 20 years of data in this data set. So this we are going to use this data set to compute the monthly mean. So with this, we are going to have uh, the monthly mean, the the decisional oscillation of temperature and we will be we will be able to remove the seasonal oscillation of our data and we were uh, computing the the monthly mean of of the temperature for 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 a period long period of time to 10 years we have are already opened this multi-year temperature file and um, with this Cell, I think it could be interesting for the for the person that previously asked it about how to compute how to compute uh, the seasonal means of of your data. And since you have your seasonal means, you you can plot your seasonal means, right? So in this case, we are not uh, computing seasonal means; we are computing uh, monthly means. That it's almost the same, right? Let me explain you. First of all, we are creating a new variable that we have called monthly mean. And this is the way we are uh, creating variables in, in XRI. It's a data array. We have to define the, the dimensions we are going to use. We are going to use the same dimensions that in the, in the, other, in the other files. We are going to use depth, latitude, and longitude. But in this case, we are going to create a new dimension, which is month. Uh, the month uh, is the, the month of the year of the mean, right? And after that, we have to define the coordinates of the, of the file with this text dictionary. I think this could be OK. This and um, this, uh, we have defining a dictionary with the coordinates with the dimensions inside. Uh, so we are using depth, latitude, and longitude, and science or the dimensions in that in that direction are the same than the, the dimensions we are using in our model uh, file in the multi-year data set, data set. We are just copying the copying the dimensions by using this. The depth dimension of this variable is exactly the same than the dimension depth in this variable or in this data set. 
the same for latitude. We are copying the latitude dimension from the multi-year data set, longitude, copying the dimension. And for the and for the case of the month, we are creating just an array of values. Uh, well, uh, why is this from one to 13? Uh, let me, if we run this cell, in Python, NPR range creates a, a vector of values from 1 to 12, not 13, right? So, for example, the, the, the person that is interested in, in, plotting, in plotting or in computing this, in computing this seasonal, seasonal means, it could be, for example, use one to five um, this will create a new dimension with four values just four values for spring autumn summer and winter and with this we use you used need four values in this dimension and well once we have created the the variable where we are going to store our moldy mean we have to uh, compute the uh, the monthly mean. To do that, we make a for loop for every month in the for every month in the in the year. And with this, we are selecting. Uh, we are with this uh, sentence. We are selecting. We are using the function from np where this function gave us the index of the values that is. Uh, uh, that is where this uh, sentence is true. So those values where the month is equal to the month we have defined it here, only the monthly mean or month, one, two, three, etc. In these values that, uh, that has this true, we are computing the mean right in the dimension time so we are selecting every oops we are selecting every value that uh, has this condition with i cell we are using the i cell the i cell uh, function is a function or devoted to selecting data not by not by values but by indexes with these cell time indexes we are selecting the or we are getting the indexes that has this condition and we are using these indexes in the time direction to select the values that uh, has these indexes and we for these values we are computing the mean right in the dimension time right so we as you probably saw, the, we have the for loop for month one, two, three, January, February, March, etc. And when the system, when the function finishes, we have this date file, which is depth, latitude, and longitude, and the month. And we have the mean value, the monthly value for for. Uh, this for this uh, block of data of depth, latitude, and longitude. And well, once we have this, we the only thing we have to do is to compute the anomalies. So how can we compute anomalies? Uh, well, here I define it a new function called compute anomalies that gets the information of the data, the multi mean of the that we have already computed and uh, a date. So we can compute anomalies with a sentence like this. We call the function compute anomalies for this date set and this variable in the, in the date set that all, okay, which is the temperature. And using these means and for this date. And what is doing this this uh, this function? Well, it just gets it is just selecting data, cell selecting the data uh, according to to 
that we need a specific date. So it selects data from data, which is the, the values of temperature. And maybe it's simpler if we go like this. Here we are selecting the, the, the values of temperature. And here we are selecting the value of Monday mean, right? How can we select this? We can select this using the, the date we, we need. And to select the month of the year, we have to first to define what month is for this date. As you can see here, the, the date we are selecting is in this format. So to do this, we can split this chain, this string in splitting using this character. So the first word of this of this splitting will be the month of the of the year, and we will read this value as an integer. So with this information, we can select the month of the year we are working on. And to compute anomalies, it's as I said before, quite simple actually. It's the value of the data, the temperature in this case and the value of the mean, the monthly mean in that case. So with this, we are removing the mean the, of the month of this year. With this, we are removing the variability of uh, the seasonal variability of data, right? So since we are computing the anomaly. Sorry, Alvaro, yeah? maybe um, a few more minutes, uh, like five minutes, would that be OK for you? Well, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, give think, some time for I, the next I one. I think I can, I can, okay, okay, I will skip the part of the current that is very similar, but well, uh, we'll go with this. Uh, Just finish well, this section. Would it be uh, maybe possible to finish this section and maybe the, the, we pass it on to, to Stefania soon? Okay, okay, yeah. no problem. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, well, with this, we are computing the anomalies uh, for the current. And well, we can run this solve. And with this, we will have the values of anomalies computed. And with this, these functions are very similar to the functions that were defined before in the previous tutorial. It's uh, just a, a, a function for plotting anomalies, uh, a map and a section so we can run. And with this, we are getting this information. As you can see, it's almost the same than before, but for example, for the case of 25 degrees, uh, the, the activity uh, here in these maps, you are getting the information with uh, the anomalies in terms of temperature. Uh, the positive anomalies are red colors, the negative anomalies are blue colors. So as you can see, probably the, the the activity of the welling is not as intense at the latitude of 25 degrees is probably more intense in this latitude, as you can see here. And here you can see the tips where you can you can have the uh, more activity of the of the welling, and you can see also if these depths correspond to to, to to the depths, well, the photic depths, let's say, the, the depths where the primary production is can be developed, for example. I will run this very fast uh, in 27 degrees, for example. 27 degrees, let's imagine. And for example, here, you can see that we are getting a cell where the, the, the upwelling is more intense this period of time is you can see clearly and you can see this cell so probably the, the fisheries in this region the specific surface and this specific depths are higher than will be higher in this period for 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 this period right uh, well we are going to jump very fast to the analysis of waves waves are also an, another parameter that affects highly affects the, the human activities right so i wanted to give you some some tools to, to analyze the waves this for this we are opening a new a new waves file 
uh, a new data set. And what we are going to do in here is plotting a map of the mean direction of waves. You can see here we have a, a function called vector map, which is almost the same function we we defined in the previous code in the previous tutorial. This takes some time, usually. Uh, with this, as before, we can get uh, very interesting information, but well, having the information of the mean wave direction and wave intensity, maybe it's not very useful because the waves are, have a uh, very high variability. High variability, so no, this is taking too much. Oh, here it is. But mm, well, it could be interesting. But so one thing that we can do is put in a wave rows diagram. That is a diagram that let me show you how is it and it will be easier and faster to explain you how how can be uh, understood this kind of diagram. In this kind of diagrams, we are mm, plotting an, an histogram of, of, data, of or data, but we are representing this histogram in a polar in a polar axis. So this is what we get. Uh, the, the, the rose diagram is defined in a specific lat latitude and longitude point. And here in colors, we have different ranges of, uh, in this case, a significant wave high. So here we have the histogram projected in polar, in polar axis. So we have the frequency, the size of these boxes, indicate the frequency of these of these values so with these you can get a lot of information of how the how the waves field is is the behavior of the wave field field and the, the statistics the variability and also the intensities right this kind of analysis is very useful for many applications. And also it's also interesting because you can apply this analysis also for any vectorial variable. For example, in the case of currents here, we, we have another data file of currents that we can open and we can also run the same code for, for this case, for the case of currents and we can plot the not the wave rows but the current rows right it takes some time well and we can for example here for the agulas current we can get this this very obviously there is not many directions because we are selected in a point like here uh, here and we have very intense values in, in climatic in climatic uh, approach and um, finally just i wanted to show you the, the combined analysis of currents uh, waves and temperature we can make uh, a combined analysis so with this kind of tools we are able to analyze the a field not from just one point of view of the temperature or of the waves we can create tools to, to analyze our field of, of data uh, from many points of view with, with a multi-variable multi uh, approach, with multi-product approach, and also with different uh, approaches. We can create uh, tools like this that are where we are able to analyze the temperature, feel the uh, vertical structure of the temperature field and also the waves and also the, the currents in this place. For example, here you can see the currents are more variable in this area than in this area. Uh, well, this is a tutorial. I, I hope this it's interesting for you and these tools could be interesting for, for your workflow every day. I'm sure it's really it's gonna be really useful. I mean, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm sorry I had to cut you. <laughs> it's very interesting and um you will all be able to follow it more in detail. Also, these uh, notebooks you will be able to follow it on Jupyter yeah. Hub. 
they are, I think, quite well explained in the text. So any user can go the, the, the tutorial and every line code line is explained it and I think it's not difficult for- Exactly, a first yeah. step, you have a short explanation on what they're gonna find and what is expected, right? So yeah, you'll be able to find it there. Thanks again, uh, Alvaro, for, uh, for this explanation. <laughs> Very welcome. Now um, we will have Stefania Chiliberti, <laughs> who's going to uh, show us a little bit about uh, how to use Copernicus Marine uh, products uh, with the uh, QGIS uh, software. Um, yes. <laughs> Hi, ho hello everyone, to this training uh, session about the QGIS. And uh, uh, the the main intention of this uh, set of exercises is, uh, let's say, to give uh, a complementary uh, overview of uh, uh, what uh, uh, before uh, Alvaro explained about the uh, region of interest that we are proposing today to you all, uh, that is the Angola Benguela uh, uh, system quite, uh, let's say, important and complex as many other regions in uh, uh, around uh, Africa in the, in, let's say, being so, let's say, um, connected, well connected with uh, uh, many important, let's say, uh, ocean sites. And uh, this is also to, let's say, to uh, comment uh, one of the uh, request from the uh, panel related to the way we can use, let's say, the Copernicus marine data also in other region, of course, we can. And uh, uh, let's try, let's say, to take these exercises really as uh, examples of what are the potentiality that uh, uh, with the Copernicus marine data and with the tools that uh, we are going to present, uh, we can really do. So, uh, uh, you will find regarding QGIS uh, uh, some uh, initial details about how to install and how to configure the plugins that today I'm going to use and to show you uh, in uh, live mode uh, into the user manual that uh, I guess uh, uh, the uh, people that are registered uh, uh, might have access. So uh, to save some time, I want to jump directly into the exercises and uh, exploit basically the capacity of QGIS to uh, provide some advanced visualization of the Copernicus marine data. To do this, uh, first of all, uh, of course, we need to open the uh, GIS uh, uh, tool. Let me just uh, one moment. Uh, I don't know how, I hope you can see my screen, but uh, I have the right panel of Zoom that is uh, giving me some uh, some uh, toolbars. So if it's okay like this, and you can see the uh, QGIS uh, uh, window, I prefer to leave like that. Uh, basically, uh, first of all, uh, I need to give some context, context in, and even support the um, uh, representation of the geographical uh, information. Uh, let's uh, exploit one of the plugins that uh, has been presented in the user manual, that is the Quick Map Services. This basically uh, provides a, a plateau of uh, um, base map that we can use uh, just to put as background to our maps. And in my case, I, uh, I would like to use the Google Hybrid that gives basically a natural uh, uh, overview of uh, our ocean and uh, with some, uh, of course, uh, uh, indications about the, with the labels of the countries uh, uh, that uh, let's say, might help in the uh, geolocalization of the sites that we are going to, to display. And uh, uh, let's uh, move now into the one of the, um, let's say, capacity of the QGIS together with uh, uh, one plugin that is also detailed, that is called CMEMS Net CDF. This is a plugin uh, that you can install uh, uh, in QGIS that uh, is made available by the Copernicus Marine Service. Uh, the description uh, on how to configure, how to install it uh, is also provided in the user manual. And uh, this plugin gives us the opportunity to, uh, let's say, load the NetCDF files directly downloaded from the Copernicus Marine Data Store and made some, uh, let's say, easy visualization of the contents in, in an easy way, in a more user-friendly way, but also making some, uh, let's say, initial manipulation. And I'll show you some examples. So in uh, uh, once you launch the plugin, 
this window is open and in the tab related on the NFCDF, if you click uh, uh, plus, you can browse into your uh, uh, working folder and select the data from the Copernicus Marine data store that you have before uh, downloaded. In my case, uh, I mean, I select, I would like to propose you one of the uh, observational product that was uh, presented yesterday by, uh, during the first day of training, that is the sea surface temperature L4 presented by Andrea. And in particular, once you load this file and you have the name and the path on the left side of this window, uh, automatically in the, the right side, you uh, have the refreshed list of variables that uh, um, uh, this uh, NetCDF file is uh, loading, is proposing basically, and together with some other tabs related on metadata and options that uh, might help you simply to define your working space. Uh, of course, we are interested to visualize the analyzed SST that is provided in Kelvin. This is the sea surface foundation temperature. And uh, to uh, load it inside uh, the uh, QGIS, simply you can uh, select doing right click and add uh, it as a layer. Uh, through the Moto client that was presented today by Alvaro, extensively also by Cedric uh, and by Anai uh, through the uh, MyOcean Pro uh, visualization tool, you can, of course, select the bounding box you want. Being a global uh, data set, so covering the whole uh, global ocean, I mean, it's, uh, let's say, um, clever to exploit the capacity of the marine data store to subset in the region of interest, and this is what I have done both in space and time. And in particular for this file, I have four timestamp. Uh, I will select uh, one of these, that is the 10th of April, well, during which the app welling start to spawn. And uh, without, I mean, uh, modifying any of these uh, settings that by default are proposing by the plugin. And I add, uh, as you can see here, automatically the map uh, being uh, georeferenced and uh, uh, being also uh, in a standard format is automatically displayed into our map. Uh, we can, of course, modify the palette uh, of this uh, uh, map simply highlighting it, selecting it and doing a, a right click with your mouse and going into properties. Into properties, you can select uh, now the uh, way you want to display, I mean, the colors that you want uh, to use for displaying this map, uh, as well as uh, the minimum and the maximum value that the palette uh, will display as well. Just for a matter of uh, being practice, uh, practice uh, we uh, can round uh, the minimum value and the maximum value of the um, of this uh, data set and we can select uh, as uh, uh, color ramp for example the turbo we can uh, provide uh, let's say as a way to display the uh, full uh, uh, color map uh, with equal intervals for example using seven uh, classes of course you can play and uh, uh, this is also a way to encourage you to, uh, let's say, explore the capacity of this uh, um, uh, software, even for displaying other type of uh, uh, variables, as uh, I'll show you briefly later. Doing applying and closing, we, we can see that uh, the, uh, the map has been adjusted in the color, uh, where uh, Basically, the uh, colors uh, towards the blue uh, uh, are related to the temperature that are um, colder than uh, the other regions where uh, the, the, the colors are going towards the red, which means that instead the, uh, the temperature, the sea surface temperature is quite tight. This is basically the sea surface temperature uh, uh, obs uh, observation that is directly taken from the satellite. And as yesterday was explained by Andrea, this is one of the uh, way we can, let's say, reach the synoptic scale of the um, uh, temperature in, the, in this case for the uh, at the surface. 
and it's quite par quite powerful and also gives to me the opportunity to introduce uh, you another function of QGIS that is uh, uh, related on, uh, I mean, I might be interested to convert the sea surface temperature here provided in Kelvin to Celsius in order, for example, to make some comparison later on with the model data that uh, provides uh, uh, the uh, temperature in uh, uh, degree Celsius. To do that, uh, you simply can go into the raster tool toolbar and select the raster calculator. It displays a new window that gives to you the opportunity to do simple arithmetic uh, uh, expression. In this case, uh, I select the, the only available uh, uh, field that is the analyzed analyze the SST for the 10 of April. And basically here I subtract 273.15, that is the conversion factor for moving temperature from Kelvin to Celsius. I decide to give the, uh, let's say the uh, uh, name to my new product uh, in a dedicated working folder. For example, I call it uh, SST Celsius in my working directory. And if I do save, automatically the path uh, is loaded together with the file name that I have chosen into the output layer uh, uh, slot. And if I do OK, uh, being only one uh, timestamp, uh, the calculation is quite uh, uh, fast. But of course, with QGIS, you can even, uh, let's say, uh, analyze the much many uh, other let's say uh, um, time frame from your SST uh, field. In this case, the color map is not really the best uh, for visualizing temperature that goes from 12 to around 30 degrees. So again, with uh, right click and going into properties, I can uh, modify the first of all the render type uh, to be single band pseudo color because I want to visualize uh, the uh, values with uh, uh, some uh, color map. Uh, set up uh, uh, manually, if you wish, uh, the minimum and the maximum value for the displayed palette and use the equal interval we, uh, mode for representing the palette with five classes for binning the temperature value. I do apply and uh, doing OK, the map is refreshed. And so you have the same, let's say, information, but this time in uh, degree Celsius uh, of the uh, sea surface temperature from the satellite. And here you can uh, easily, as before was also, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, mentioned by Alvaro, we, uh, we can uh, easily spot the cold signal of temperature that is uh, uh, raising in the uh, uh, Namibia, South Africa coastal zone. Uh, which is extremely important from uh, uh, a coastal management point of view, but also from the ecosystem point of view, being a place where basically it's devoted, is uh, let's say ready to host, uh, let's say some life in the sense that uh, it uh, uh, combines, uh, it gives to us the opportunity to see some uh, uh, grow of phyto phytoplankton in this specific uh, uh, region. And so where we can potentially find some, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, fishing spots uh, uh, that can be and should be sustainable, preserved uh, in our ocean. And uh, the upwelling is characteristic because uh, you can see even from just giving a visual, let's say, uh, feeling of this, uh, uh, this through this map uh, that uh, from the coastline towards offshore, we might have even more than five degrees of uh, difference. Uh, in, in the sense that uh, the, the coastal zone is really quite uh, cold. And uh, this is one of the results of the Bengala current that uh, um, flows into the um, uh, uh, Namibia, uh, South Africa um, coastline. And that uh, somehow, as, was, uh, as it was before uh, uh, also described by Alvaro, he met uh, basically the Ang uh, Angola current that is flowing from the north toward the south in the so-called angola Benguela um, uh, frontal zone, which is a, a, a zone uh, thermodynamically very unstable. Uh, but uh, through this, uh, uh, let's say, plug-in, we can also uh, 
link uh, other type of uh, variables that might be extremely useful uh, to, to monitor uh, when we do some uh, uh, spatial monitoring of the coastal uh, or of the regional area that you are interested to, to monitor. And in this case, I want to load, for example, another Copernicus product that is uh, the one provided by the uh, uh, Global Ocean Analysis and Forecast Biogeochemical System that yesterday was described by Coralie. And uh, in this case, uh, I have been selected uh, uh, three major, let's say, variables, the uh, uh, concentration of the dissolved uh, oxygen in water, the concentration of chlorophyll uh, uh, in the sea, and the net primary production. Let's see how it looks like the chlorophyll for the 10th of April. Again, we add it uh, simply as a layer. We select uh, the day of uh, reference that we want to analyze and doing add basically the, um, the map is visualized in the area in our study area and you can see here basically that thanks to this uh, um, uh, cold water and the light basically here the concentration of uh, chlorophyll is uh, um, uh, extremely high but on the other side, of course, if this, uh, if this is uh, important from uh, a, a physical point of view, on the other side, from the, um, if we look on the ecosystem health, this might be also an alarm, a threat, because we might have zones here where we might face some um, let's say uh, diminishing of the oxygen, and in this case, when the uh, during the spawning of the upwelling, we can see that in in this region where we have the highest concentration of chlorophyll, we uh, might have uh, uh, let's say a, um, a reduction in the oxygen uh, uh, that is present in the ocean. Let me add now the. Uh, uh, field about the oxygen. Let me just change the uh, palette because uh, this one doesn't work very well for our purposes. Let's fix uh, manually the minimum and the maximum, for example. And here you can see we might have uh, in the area where we have the highest concentration of chlorophyll sort of diminished the amount of oxygen in the water. And you can easily, let's say, query the map by selecting uh, this identify feature and once you click into the um, into the map you can let's say for that specific pixel recognize the amount of uh, dissolved oxygen in the water that is uh, uh, provided uh, in uh, uh, millimol millimol per uh, uh, per meter uh, by meter cubic in the in the ocean so this is somehow a, um, a way to uh, display uh, in a powerful way the um, uh, Copernicus marine data through the QGIS. Uh, but of course, uh, this kind of software uh, provides us also the opportunity to make some analysis, uh, uh, in particular of the data that we are downloading from the Copernicus marine uh, data store. And this is the case I want to show you. Uh, basically, uh, let me just deactivate uh, these, uh, 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 let's say, these fields. For example, uh, uh, you might be interested as, uh, uh, let's say, um, stakeholders or students, uh, researchers. I mean, when you uh, have to deal with uh, um, Earth system uh, uh, models and uh, you have to, let's say, manipulate some modeling or observational data set or even set up new models, the first thing we need to do is really to know the, um, the region where we are working. And in particular, this can be extremely easily, easily to be done if we select, uh, for example, the bathymetry that is uh, provided by the Copernicus uh, uh, Global uh, uh, global Ocean Analysis and Forecasting System that yesterday was presented by Marie. And then through the uh, plugin, the CMEMS NetCDF, uh, let me go to add another file. This is the 
uh, mask bati, the one that uh, directly comes from the um, global ocean forecasting system. And if I do uh, simply open and I load it, uh, automatically I can see the list of variables that this file is going to provide to us. I am interested mainly on uh, uh, selecting the seafloor depth below the geoid, uh, that is the depth uh, of I add it uh, as a layer. And uh, without, let's say, touching any of these uh, settings, uh, I do add in my, uh, in my QGIS software. Uh, as pointed also into the, in, in the user manual, the majority of the um, Copernicus marine data are accessible through many interfaces, uh, including MOTU that gives to you the opportunity to subset automatically directly from the marine data store. But this type of uh, product, like the bathymetry, for example, might be uh, being, uh, let's say, some files that uh, are uh, uh, native of the model that is used uh, for producing the analysis and forecast product uh, might be provided in the global, in the uh, real uh, dom uh, spatial domain that is, uh, let's say, given by the, um, by the product catalog. So in this case, I might be interested just to subset by myself uh, with the help of QGIS, uh, the bathymetry in the area of interest. To do that, uh, somehow also gives to me the opportunity to uh, present you one another uh, function, another important function that uh, any type of GIS, geographical information system has, uh, is the creation of a layer. A layer is an object basically that uh, might contain some information in a pixel like a raster or might have also some other metadata inside as we will see later on, uh, let's say as a vector. But here, let's start to simply progressively by creating a new layer. Uh, and uh, I want to add a new shapefile layer in my, uh, in my uh, QGIS software. First of all, once I click uh, like that, uh, uh, a new shapefile layer window is open. I want to give, uh, for example, the name of uh, my uh, of this new object uh, in the working directory that uh, I want, I am using for uh, saving all my intermediate results. For example, I call it uh, mask body. And uh, I need to choose which type of geometry I want to create. Mm, QGIS gives to me the opportunity to create points as a shape file or multi-point or even lines or polygons. In my case, uh, since I want an area, I'm uh, interested to uh, figure out how to uh, create a polygon shape file here. Automatically, the QGIS uh, uh, is able to recognize which is the projection uh, that uh, is used by the source uh, uh, field that in my case is the global uh, uh, bathymetry. And simply doing like that and doing okay, you can see that in the uh, left panel, the, uh, in the layer controller, uh, uh, the mask body object has been created. Of course, now we need to give to it uh, uh, a shape. To do this, uh, let's go in uh, the toolbar and select the toggle editing. That is this uh, icon with the pencil that activates uh, the possibility to modify uh, the mask body, the shape file that I have been created. And once uh, uh, this is selected, an additional number of icons uh, uh, are highlighted in the toolbar. And in this case, uh, since we want to add a polygon fe feature, we uh, select this icon, then consequently opens another icon that gives to you the uh, multiple choice uh, in the way you want to digitize this type of uh, uh, shape file, this type of polygon by segment, by curve. I am interested very simply to use, uh, to digitize the shape. The shape will be regular in the sense that I want simply to uh, extract a rectangular in the area of uh, my interest, so in the Angola Benguela system, but of course uh, we might do the same in the Algerian uh, uh, Gulf as before was uh, uh, asked by one of the um, attendees, if I remember correctly. And uh, Let's do, uh, let's say, let's uh, draw now into the map directly this uh, uh, shape file, doing a click 
this uh, um, feature is uh, let's say created automatically and once i am uh, happy with the, the type of shape that i'm uh, going to create i do right click i provide an id just to let QGIS to let's say classify this uh, mask body with the proper uh, number uh, uh, that uh, identify it i do i doing okay i have created this rectangle um, of course i mean i'm can continue to customize uh, the mask body in a way that, for example, gives to me the opportunity to uh, have a look on what uh, we have in the background, in the map. In this case, I want to use an outlined uh, red, uh, uh, but uh, transparent uh, uh, rectangle that uh, gives to me also the opportunity to watch uh, at the bathymetry in the background. And once I'm happy with this, I simply deactivate the toggle editing, saving the result of my of my uh, uh, elaboration, let's say. Now, just uh, one step before the end, uh, we need now somehow to connect the bathymetry given at global uh, domain uh, from the marine data store with this specific object that I have created. So doing a sort of cut of the bathymetry into the area of my interest. To do this, uh, I use uh, again from the uh, raster toolbar uh, a function that is the extraction. And uh, in the extraction, we might have different, let's say, opportunities, different options to, to define it. For example, I would like to uh, clip this raster by using the mask layer that I have created. So I give uh, as input layer, in this case, uh, the global uh, bathymetry that I previously loaded uh, thanks to the CMEMS NetCVF plugin and the mask body that I just created right now. There are some other uh, optional things that you can set up. Uh, which I recommend in any case to check because it's related on the projection that you are going to use uh, in this case uh, for the uh, final, uh, let's say, product. And once you have set up basically the same projection as the input uh, field, you do run and doing close, automatically the bathymetry is clipped in the area of my interest. I can now move on by customizing again the palette. I'll go very fast because uh, it's something that we have at this moment we have learned how to do. So I'll use a single bound pseudo color uh, with a minimum value, for example, of eight meters and maximum of uh, 5,700 meters. That is the maximum depth in this region. So you see that it's a very, very deep uh, region. Uh, and as a uh, um, color map, for example, I use Viridis uh, with uh, equal intervals. I'm happy with five classes, so I do OK. And automatically, the uh, palette is adjusted with uh, uh, minimum and maximum value has displayed in the, in the palette uh, on the left. Uh, of course, I mean, this is uh, a way to, uh, let's say, uh, even to uh, optimize and to exploit the QGIS uh, uh, function for those uh, data sets that might be present in the Copernicus uh, Marine Data Store that are not interfaced with uh, any subsetter. So, but in any case, you can use you, uh, the, 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 the approach of clipping can be applicable for any other scalar field that you are uh, uh, interested to use. And just to conclude this part, I would like to show you another uh, uh, function, another plugin really that uh, uh, I suggested to uh, uh, install in, uh, in your QGIS software, that is the terrain profile. The terrain profile uh, basically somehow uh, would like uh, to do something uh, quite similar to what uh, Alvaro was uh, uh, showing before, even if uh, in the case of the bathymetry, having just a 2D field, we, what we expect uh, is simply a profile of the bathymetry in a specific section. But let's see how it works. So once uh, it is activated, uh, basically, a new uh, window is open uh, below the map. And uh, uh, let's say to query now with the profile tool uh, this uh, map, I need to add uh, the layer 
uh, as a layer the clipped mask that I have been uh, just right now uh, selected, uh, created, sorry. And now by just clicking uh, in uh, drawing, a, let's say, a, a section in my uh, in my map directly, I can uh, visualize quite nicely the, uh, let's say, the profile of the bat bathymetry at uh, the specific, uh, let's say, uh, latitude that is around uh, 19 degrees south. And this is extremely nice uh, tool because you can really uh, detect the peculiarities of your uh, uh, domain. For example, the seamount uh, that uh, is uh, this one that uh, from, sorry, it's, let me draw again, the Vema seamount that is uh, uh, really nicely represented by the model. So we can even appreciate the degree of details uh, that the global ocean forecasting system is providing in terms of uh, let's say, uh, physical information, because it's using a bathymetry that is able to capture at its resolution of 1 to 12 degrees of uh, resolution in the space uh, some features that are fundamental, especially for monitoring the um, um, ecosystem um, uh, health in, uh, in the region itself, or also for doing some uh, fishing uh, uh, management, uh, uh, let's say, in the area. And you can see here, for example, that uh, this uh, seamount, uh, you can have a look uh, that, uh, of course, here uh, it, I'm also crossing the uh, Wallis uh, Ridge, that is another uh, very complicated bathymetric structure uh, uh, available in, in the region itself. So this is just to, just to conclude in a way, let's say, to extract uh, in uh, interactive mode some information from your uh, uh, bathymetric data set. But this applies, I mean, if I load the oxygen or the chlorophyll or the temperature, the same kind of, uh, let's say, approach can be used and the profile tool will return to you basically the uh, let's say the uh, sequence of uh, temperature value or chlorophyll or oxygen uh, given a specific latitude or longitude through a, a drone section. Uh, so let's continue a bit, uh, uh, let's say moving uh, to another uh, way uh, of analyzing the data that might be of your interest, uh, um, especially if you uh, think to, let's say, to exploit the uh, geographical information system in a way that uh, basically uh, can, uh, uh, let's say, uh, support the coastal management or the understanding of uh, the, uh, or giving to you some, uh, uh, let's say, support for uh, the sustainable growth of your region, or if you are a port authorities and you want really to monitor a specific area in your domain. Of course, here, I mean, for us, uh, the, uh, the mantra of this uh, uh, training is the upwelling. So where basically we have the cold and nutrient-rich waters uh, in, the, in, the, in the region that, uh, of course, brings also some important economical and societal uh, impact uh, because of the importance of the fishing sector in this, in this region. And uh, we know that uh, from literature that uh, usually the um, upwelling region uh, that is uh, uh, quasi permanent or totally permanent in the in this uh, in the Namibian uh, uh, coastline uh, is uh, really interesting uh, portion of the coastal zone up to 300 meters depth. So I want to use uh, this uh, number, this, uh, uh, let's say, the 300 meter depth as maximum reached by the, let's say, more or less by the upwelling, just to the, try to set up a tool that gives to me the opportunity to extract uh, some metrics from uh, the uh, Copernicus marine data, for example, the temperature that I can monitor along the time. So to do that, I first need to uh, modify, I mean, to, to uh, detect from the bathymetric uh, um, data set uh, this number. So filter basically the uh, bathymetry and retaining only the layers that are up to 300 meters. To do this, 
basically I go, I'm, I need to convert my given bathymetry into a polygon. And to do this, so convert particular this polygon to a vector. So I'll use uh, from the raster toolbar, the, um, and if I go to the conversion, I'll use the uh, polygonides uh, raster to vector function. Uh, as input layer, I give the uh, clipped mask because it's the one that I want to, uh, let's say, to manipulate. I can give a more reasonable, uh, let's say, the <laughs> name of the field. Uh, let's call it depth O, like the, that is the standard name chosen by the Global Ocean Forecasting System to present the bathymetry into the net CDF. And uh, I want to save the, um, uh, basically, the uh, result into my working directory. For example, here I call polygon. Just so once I have uh, set up this, I'm going to run. And uh, basically, the result will be, as you can see, uh, the raster has been somehow fragmented in many polygons that have an ID, have a, contains a certain information. And of course, in, in this way, I can now, uh, let's say, uh, exploit the capacity of the, uh, let's say, um, uh, discretized information in these polygons to filter out the values that I'm not interested to analyze. But before doing this, uh, it is recommended also into the QGIS manual to run another function that is uh, available in the processing toolbar if uh, you select toolbox that is called fixed geometries. This function basically has the uh, capacity to um, automatically correct some potential, uh, let's say, inconsistency due to this conversion from raster to vector. Is by simply, let's say, removing some invalid uh, shapes that are not really meaningful from the geometrical point of view. I mean, it does a sort of correction a posteriori of your uh, field. So I give to my fixed geometries function as input layer the polygon that I want to correct. And I return a new file that I save into my working directory that I call, it, uh, I call fixed polygon. Okay, now that I'm sure that everything is uh, uh, setting properly, I run this function. So from the qualitative point of view, you can cannot even appreciate, at least for me, it's really hard to appreciate the difference with respect to the other, to the other field, but I can tell you that for sure there are some differences. And of course, we are interested to work with this type of uh, final product. And now, I can, uh, let's say, extract the information that I want. So doing right click in fixed polygon, so in this intermediate product that I have and selecting a filter, I can give a, an expression for the query, uh, in particular for the field that I want to uh, filter, that is depth O. So as I was mentioning before, I'm interested to filter only the values of the bathymetry that are uh, uh, above 300 meters, okay? So I want to discard the deepest uh, uh, part of the regional uh, zone that I'm analyzing. So the depth zero should be uh, greater than, uh, in this case, eight meters, that is the minimum value of the bathymetry, uh, the resolved bathymetry from the Global Ocean Forecasting System, and depth zero should be uh, less uh, equal than 300 meters. Okay, if I do like this, basically, as you can see, the map is automatically refreshed. And so all the other values that are below 300 meters depth are basically hidden. So are not part of my, uh, let's say, analysis. Uh, now that I have this object, of course, I want to, let's say, to focus much more the attention on one specific region of my, uh, of the Angola Bengala system, that is the central Namibia, one of the regions where usually the upwelling can be considered really as a quasi, semi, a quasi permanent feature uh, uh, over there, uh, along the, the year. 
of course, with some uh, interannual fluctuations due to the, uh, let's say, the temperature that might, uh, let's say, um, of course, change because of the uh, dynamical pattern uh, given in this uh, in the in the region itself in the coastal zone. So to do, uh, to uh, let's say concentrate the um, uh, attention in the region that is between 25 degrees south 29 degrees south i need to create a new layer so a new shape file layer so again uh, let's go into the layer toolbar create layer and open the new shape file layer i give to my uh, new shape file a name for example central pardon i'll do it uh, in my working directory i do like this because otherwise if you simply uh, put uh, the name of the file uh, uh, directly without giving a path it will be automatically saving your QG qgis uh, folder which sometimes is not the best especially if you are doing some tests so i recommend all the time before launching a new project uh, just to uh, initiate a, a folder a proper working folder where to host uh, basically your uh, your files uh, now i call it uh, central namibia for example I save and the geometry type is again a polygon but this will be a different polygon with respect to what we saw before uh, for me the I mean the uh, projection is fine the rest uh, we can leave as it is we do okay so again the object has been created now as we did before, we need to draw in, in our map the region that we want to, uh, let's say, uh, analyze. And to do that, we activate the toggle editing. Once this toggle editing is activated, again, I can add the polygon features. But this time, instead of digitizing a shape, a regular shape, I want to digitize a segment because I want really to follow somehow the uh, structure of the uh, of this belt that uh, I selected uh, before with my query. And in this case, for example, I want to concentrate more or less my attention into in the region that is uh, uh, between 25 and 29 degrees. So I start, uh, let's say, drawing directly in the map. Let me try, for example, like this. Now, more or less, I mean, this is just as demonstrative of the of the function of QGIS, I give, uh, uh, once I I'm happy with the shape, I do right click uh, and automatically this window with the prescription of the ID uh, is visualized. So I do okay. Now the, uh, the shape has been created. And uh, uh, basically now I need to, let's say to, um, somehow to link uh, this uh, object that is uh, related this new shape file with uh, the multi polygons that i have uh, uh, extracted before but before doing this i save um, the shape file that i have just uh, created now that i have these two uh, information through the vector toolbar, because what you have in background is a vector now, I select the geoprocessing tool and I select in particular intersection. The intersection, basically, what we'll do is to uh, intersect the two shape files. One is the, the central Namibia, that is um, the, uh, the, the region where I want to, let's say, focus my attention, and the overlay layer is the multiple polygons that I have in my belt, in the coastal belt uh, along the Namibia zone. I save the result into a file. For example, I call it uh, Central Namibia region, and I do a run. Once finished, you can see that uh, basically I just, uh, uh, oops. I just deselect the previous shape file. Now the central Namibia region is colored differently from the other, let's say, uh, the belt that you have in the coast along the, the um, western coastline of uh, the Africa. 
simply because I mean I intersected the information with uh, the um, uh, given uh, shape file that I have drawn before. Now uh, the last step is uh, to let's say unify all this polygon and make just one unique object. To do this, I again uh, query the vector toolbar. I select the uh, geoprocessing tool and I use the dissolve function that uh, will take the central Namibia region as uh, so the one in all in uh, uh, red orange color and I create. Uh, I save the result into a new file that I call, for example, Central Namibia region merged. I save, I run, and then once it's finished, you see that you have finally a shape file that have uh, differently from before when we draw into the bathymetry now has a meaning. So basically it collects all the cells that have uh, a bathymetric value uh, that is uh, uh, between uh, eight, uh, 8 meters and 300 meters. Now the last uh, step is to load the um, uh, Copernicus data that I want to analyze, for which I want to do some spatial analysis, really some spatial analysis. So again, I'll use the NetCDF, uh, the CMEMS NetCDF plugin. And in this case, I, before, starting our training, I was uh, downloading from the marine data store the uh, value of temperature at the surface from 1st of May up to the 19th of May. So basically uh, covering also today, uh, but uh, uh, simply to give you to, to give to me the opportunity to uh, suggest you, I mean, the, the powerful way we can exploit the QGIS functionality in doing some monitoring. Because of course the Copernicus Marine uh, uh, service provide not only information about the past ocean, but also forecast data, okay? Not only the reconstruction of what is the sea state in the past, but also a prediction of what will be in the future. And this is extremely important when you want really to make some management of your coastal zone. And this is the reason why, I mean, I found interesting to propose you uh, uh, to analyze just for matter of uh, uh, brevity, uh, one layer of the temperature field from the 1st of May up to the 19th of May. So today, that is 11, we have the first day, I mean, I downloaded before, so the 11th should be a, a, a forecast day up to the 19th. So this, the last part, the last uh, eight, uh, nine days of this, uh, um, um, of this uh, time series uh, are forecast, while before the 11, all these values are analysis. So as yesterday Marie was explaining, is basically the result of the model run once it assimilated also the observation. So we have the best initial condition for our forecasting cycle. Now I need to select uh, basically the time series and to do that, I need to uh, push control in the keyboard and select one by one the uh, days that I want to load. I I hope hope that it works because sometimes I mean we will see. I'm a bit scared now about this exercise, but let's do add. Okay, so now all the as you can see, all the temperature fields from the first of May until the 19th of uh, uh, may have been loaded into QGIS. Of course, again, you can modify, customize your palette. You can do really many things uh, with QGIS as we did before. And uh, through the processing toolbox here, I select zonal statistics. So zonal statistics is basically a function that is nothing in QGIS. 
that gives to me the opportunity to calculate statistics from uh, raster layers, uh, as in my case, uh, are the uh, value of temperature directly loaded from the uh, CMEMS NetCDF plugin, and overlapping it, so extracting some information and making some computation once we give to it uh, some vector layer, some vector shape file, and we have the vector shape file that we created before. Of course, this uh, can be done if you are in testing mode, you want just to, to try with one day, you can uh, simply, let's say, fill the information that you have in this first uh, window. Uh, here, for example, is preloaded the raster layer that I want to use, that is uh, the uh, temperature on the 19th of, uh, of May. And I can give as input layer, the central Namibia region merged, so the famous polygon, irregular polygon with uh, merged uh, polygons in, inside. But since I'm, I have more than, uh, I mean, I have 19 days uh, to analyze, I would like to exploit the running of the zonal statistics through a batch process. So I do like this. I select uh, uh, run it as a batch process, so it means that uh, the calculation will be done in a loop that uh, basically goes from the first to the last date available in my uh, time series. And this is quite nice because uh, the, the same logic can be exploited also for other type of uh, functions uh, of QGIS for doing some, uh, let's say, intersection, for merging, for uh, interpolating, for clipping you can imagine that uh, the process that uh, we made at the beginning just with one single file can be done in a loop uh, through the batch process uh, uh, tool. So uh, here there, is, uh, there are some shortcut that gives to us the opportunity to, uh, let's say, to select uh, in a clever way the input data. In my case, I mean, I want to use the central Namibia merged, uh, let's say, shape file, and I want to select uh, from the open layers, the uh, field that I want to analyze. Let me, I try to, to select all of them. Uh, I hope that uh, it works properly. So I selected basically the temperature fields from the 1st to the 19th of May. Now, of course, I mean, what uh, I have prescribed for the first day uh, in terms of input layer, I have to do also for the remaining 18 days. So I'll exploit the autofill uh, uh, function, filling down the one-to-one uh, -one connection between input and raster layer, uh, simply doing uh, a fill down like this. So I basically um, spread the information related to the Central Namibia region merge that is the input layer to the other uh, days remaining uh, raster files. Um, the raster band is, uh, we can keep like this because it's how it is uh, coming once it is loaded through the plugin. And uh, as well as the output column prefix, maybe you might be interested, for example, to, uh, let's say, give a tag to your, uh, uh, to, to the specific, uh, let's say, statistic that uh, you are computing, in this case, uh, linking it to theta O, but I mean, this is a detail. What is nice is that uh, we can select the statistics, and here QGIS gives to you uh, a vast choice of uh, statistics. In our case, uh, since we are interested to monitor the evolution, I mean, to have some synthetic information about what might be the mean value of the temperature in that region, or the maximum, or the minimum, or the variance itself, I'll select just for among this list of uh, statistics that QGIS provides to me. And again, I need to, let's say, expand the, uh, it through the whole list of files that I have. The last step is to define uh, the name of the uh, output file. In my case, I mean, in the, the rationale here is quite, uh, let's say, again, is quite nice, quite clever in QGIS, because you can simply provide the tag of the file that you of the file name that you want to create, like in this case stats, and then in the exact moment you ask to QGIS to save it, it gives to you 
recognizing that you have provided to it a, a list, if the uh, file name of your output file needs to be autofilled, auto autofilled somehow with what? Without uh, anything, with some numbers or with the parameter values. I choose the fill uh, with the parameter values because uh, the parameter that I want to use is basically the raster layer. So the name of the raster that I have loaded before. So basically here, you can see that the, uh, the, the, this column is automatically filled with, uh, in particular, the target directory that uh, I'm going to, uh, let's say, to use to host uh, the results. And the name will be stats underscore root of the name coming directly from the um, uh, raster layer, basically. So in this way, I, I can, let's say, even uh, maintain a sort of coherency between uh, the input and the output information. And now I run. And it is stopped, of course, because it's, uh, because it's like this. <laughs> OK, no problem. I mean, it stopped it because I have uh, most probably many, uh, many um, layers open, but no panic. If I do like this, I can still, uh, let's say, exp let's say exp um, import the results that have been calculated in this, uh, in this exercise. So to visualize them, I create a new subgroup. So, Let's go in the layer uh, in the layer uh, 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 panel, and I create a new group that I call stats, where basically I will I will uh, load all the um, uh, results that I have that the QGIS was able to compute in the uh, in this first part of the running. Maybe it's still running because I can, but we cannot wait until the end uh, to, com let's say, to complete the, uh, the calculation, but that is a detail. I mean, I do drag and drop inside uh, this new group of files that I have created. And now let me just, I mean, of course, here I, I have, uh, as you can see, from the 1st of May until the 10th of May, a list of uh, polygons. Each of uh, these polygons is equipped. If you do right click uh, and you open uh, uh, the attribute table, it is equipped with a certain, uh, let's say, uh, number of columns that in this case are related to the mean value, the minimum, the maximum, and the variance. But of course, it's a bit, uh, let's say, complicated to um, open one by one each of the, in this case, uh, uh, 10 uh, uh, layers. Uh, but in the case, uh, once uh, the, the computation is finished, the, the 19, uh, uh, let's say, time uh, stamp available. So uh, the last thing that I can do, I mean, of course, QGIS gives to me the opportunity to uh, overcome these uh, difficulties by invoking the data management tool that uh, uh, provides to me the option to merge vector layers like the ones that I have selected. So in this case, I open basically the, I select basically the uh, results of my zonal statistics uh, um, uh, process and I create a file in the in my working directory that, for example, I call stats final. Okay, so everything should be right. And indeed, once we launch the run and we uh, and the run is complete, you will see that a new vector layer appears in the left panel in the layer menu. And if you click on, uh, you do right click and you open the attributes table, basically you have the time series from the uh, 1st of uh, May up to the 10th of May. In this case, for the mean uh, value of temperature, the minimum, the maximum, and the variance that is computed in the region of interest. 
So in this way, we can see basically, you can then uh, make some uh, further manipulation or export uh, this uh, uh, table as a CSV uh, format, for example, and open it uh, with a Jupyter notebook uh, as uh, somehow exploiting some of the features that before was uh, have been presented by Alvaro. And so making some plots uh, or I mean, even inside the QGIS, it is possible even to, let's say, create some dedicated plugin. So interface QGIS uh, with uh, um, uh, Python. And, uh, but of course, I mean, being the purpose of this uh, first uh, training, uh, just uh, uh, to give you an overview of what we can do uh, with uh, this kind of software. I mean, we uh, can, uh, let's say, accept that as output, we have a table that then the user can export in the format uh, he or she wants. But this simply to the, the final message is that uh, thanks to this, let's say, kind of software, we might um, we uh, are really facilitated to do some spatial analysis in the in the regions. And in, for example, in the user manual, I was also uh, proposing you again for monitoring purposes to uh, uh, select some. Uh, um, some transects, for example, that can be used as virtual sections for uh, monitoring some key variables uh, in the in the user manual is presented the temperature, but uh, that can uh, be also extended to other variables like the chlorophyll, the oxygen, and uh, link, uh, cross-link any type of data set. So not only the modeling data set that uh, um, yesterday have been presented by Alice, Marie, and Coralie for the global forecasting systems, but also the observational data sets uh, uh, regarding the sea surface temperature or the ocean color. I mean, you can really have a platform uh, that uh, complement what the MyOcean ProView provides at today as a state of the art for the visualization with some, uh, let's say, more advanced uh, uh, way to compute uh, uh, statistics uh, and make some, uh, let's say, manipulation of your files. So I think that my time is uh, finished and uh, I thank you for uh, your uh, attention. I'm thank sorry you, for Stephanie. this unfortunate color. I'll try to do. <laughs> Don't worry, <laughs> I, I couldn't this. interrupt you. <laughs> no, I, I, I try it, but you know, I'm not. I did see that. The problem of my, I apologize. <laughs> Don't worry. It's not my Purple. usual color. <laughs> Purple Stefania. <laughs> we will have here. Don't worry about that. It gives more uh, more color to the yeah, workshop. Yeah, right. This is the color that uh, <laughs> that the, the computer decided. I mean. <laughs> yes. Don't worry at all. Um. So we do have. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting. It's really nice to see also the same topic but in different um, softwares. Um. We do have some questions for you already. Um. Okay. Let me share with you. I have to say, uh, it's uh, you guys are great <laughs> keeping it for so long. Um, um, so it, can you see my screen at the moment? I think um, you might be able. Otherwise, I thanks uh, for for the patience in uh, also. No, yeah. <laughs> Not at all. I think I won't be able to share this once, but I can uh, I mean, just, you can, uh, you can see it right here, right? OK. Oh, uh, I can read it out loud. So yes, um, which QGIS? Yes, uh, which QGIS version is ideal for altimetry analysis? If there is, well, I mean, there is uh, really no uh, constraint in the sense that uh, you can uh, um, uh, use the QGIS, the last stable version, and uh, I I ensure you that. Uh, um, for matter of time, I wasn't able to present, but I opened also sea uh, level uh, data, and uh, they are uh, perfectly, uh, let's say, georeferenced geo and visualized in the QGIS. So, if you take the last version, the one that is recommended in the Copernicus uh, Marine uh, mm -hmm. document, uh, uh, I mean, you in, in principle there. I can tell you that there are no specific uh, problems. Uh, of course, if you face some uh, specific uh, issues, uh, uh, let us know. We can try to support and eventually uh, we can, uh, let's say, even uh, exploit the community that is around QGIS even to, let's say, submit eventually issues that the users might find. I mean, uh, this is the way uh, the community works and, uh, and they are very supportive. So 
in any case, we are here in case you have uh, you face some issues with uh, any specific version. But in principle, I can tell you that you can use whatever version you want uh, right. among the, the last ones that are, yeah. of course. Yeah. Um, and a second one, um, can I use ArcGIS to perform this function and achieve the same results? Absolutely. How. Yes. Maybe demonstrating will be a bit hard right now, but uh, yes, <laughs> yes <laughs> if you exactly. if you have experience with ArcGIS. Yeah. The, the philosophy, I mean, the approach uh, of the geographical information system is al always the same. I mean, uh, you know, the GIS works with raster and vectors, so um, shape files. So uh, basically, you the same, uh, let's say, uh, type of analysis uh, and even more that you can do in QGIS, you can do even in ArcGIS. Then it depends on the platform that you want to use. And um, one last one. Uh, I'm not sure if it's very specific and if you remember this step, uh, Stefania, but is there an equivalent of OSGO? for w for linux distribution was it something you mentioned maybe well yeah i mean for uh, from what i know i mean i installed the uh, qgis in windows machine but uh, there should be also the possibility to install in the linux uh, uh, distribution so uh, i guess that maybe uh, we need to find and eventually we can um, check what is written also in our uh, guidelines if there is something very specific for the Linux that uh, um, might be helpful to be highlighted. But in, in, uh, as far as I know, I mean, QGIS can work also in, uh, in uh, Linux. And of course, I mean, being hosted by the OS Geo 4W, uh, you can, uh, let's say, um, you should be in principle able to install. But uh, let's uh, let me recheck again, and uh, I'll come back uh, with the proper uh, answer uh, after the the training. I mean, we will keep in contact. Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for your presentation as well. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and um, yes, we have reached the end of this workshop. <laughs> I hope you will all enjoy it and. Uh, um, as we uh, said it throughout the workshop, you can find all the materials on the Padlet. Um, you will soon also receive an email with um, some more information and these useful links. Maybe it can be useful to have it all in that email, as some of you have suggested. Um, and um, what else can I tell you? Yes, thank you all for your participation and for your questions. Um, and to all our speakers today, <laughs> to Anais as well, you're still here. Uh, thank you for your demonstrations. And if you still have questions, you can uh, post them uh, on the Padlet. We have uh, a section where you will be able to post your questions. And um, if you have any questions throughout your practice, um, and I hope you will be able to redo these tutorials we had today. And uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Thank you bye all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.